right, but here we really start. Mike, see the, the blob that is in the middle of our screen? Apparently not on when people are Zooming. It says this meeting is being recorded by the host. How do we get rid of that? Somebody's got to click on it and say, got it. We tried that. <laughs> there's, a, there's a keyboard here, right? We could. No, just the top one. That's what they don't think. Get it. There we go. Thank what you. Golly. I was going to give it a jab. Uh, no, I tried that. I'll add another. Yeah. Didn't. Okay, welcome. Welcome to everybody. Um, do we have any changes to the agenda? I've got two items that I was hoping could be added. Uh, North Hyde Park crosswalk pilot project, $3,100 and gravel crushing, 45,000. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, 45,000. I like a little number. Yeah. <clears throat> and any public comments? No. Okay. Uh, next one is Tree Warden. Introduction, Dave Palumbo. Sure, if you want. So I am the volunteer tree warden. Why? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Hey, <laughs> why? I'm talking into it. Come on. <laughs> it's a good question. <laughs> Did they twist their arm like this? Up it there? wasn't. Well, I don't know. I guess I was looking for something to do. <laughs> Not that I don't have enough to do, but. One little bit. Thank you, Dave. I've been taking the uh, tree warden school classes online, and they're actually really good. Yep. There's a lot more to this than than I ever realized, but I'm willing to give it a shot. Sure. Great. Well, I think good. part of it is you know you, you get what you can get done because it's, sure, sure. you think of that like it's written for. And here's the city of Burlington that has a tree warden and 17 staff, and here's Hyde yeah. Park with a volunteer tree warden. <laughs> yeah, no, I was on a thing to Zoom today with the tree wardens from uh, towns like with 500 people. Oh, good. It's, you know, oh, really? And, yeah. What the hell's Brighton? And, <laughs> and then another guy comes over. Oh, I'm in Rochester, and I'm right near. You know, Lester didn't know Brighton. Brighton was it? Okay, Brighton, yeah. I know. You didn't know Brighton? Oh, no, it wasn't Brighton. Was Brighton was no, I know Brighton is town. Okay. Is, uh, Island, is, uh, Island Pond. Yeah. Yeah, this was something else. I, <laughs> I should know. I used to. I, so, I formerly, I was a uh, solar, I was one of the first solar designer installers in Vermont. I ran that business for 25 years. So, I got all over Vermont, mostly rural, because we didn't start doing grid tie until near the end of my career and that, I didn't get really caught to that as much as helping off grid small folks and that was what I really loved to do. Sure. So I'm still off grid up there in, in off the center road in mm -hmm. our neighborhood, happily off grid. And uh, I know uh, we ended up with a big wood lot and I've been a tree farmer now since I'm not a solar engineer. Do you still and have that many turbines? Oh yeah, I got a hydro. Stuff? I got a hydro turbine. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, that still still hums along mostly yeah. in the uh, mostly in the winter. Yeah, right now I got it shut off because it's you know I keep the, the pond level up in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, yep. Yeah. yeah. So it's uh, interesting stuff, but uh, you know I've been studying on the trees and I belong to the Vermont Woodlands Association, and uh, through that I volunteered to work at the uh, semi-annual. Um, loggers, Northeastern Loggers Exposition at the Champlain uh, Fairgrounds this weekend. And that was great. So every year, they, one year they do it in Maine, one year they do it in in, uh, in Essex. Mm. And that was super fun. And uh, got to meet a lot of people and tell them about what the Vermont Woodlands Association does. And uh, it's great. And, uh, so, I'm, um, uh, so one of the things that I'd like to do besides the nitty gritty of, of when trees uh, and right of ways and municipal trees are an issue is one of the things that, they, that uh, they're hoping tree wardens can do is help 
be a resource to educate people on what trees can do. And you know, people tend to take trees for uh, granted, especially in a state like Vermont. You know, we're tree rich, but and they're there and they're beautiful, and and uh, we need to uh, appreciate them uh, because of what they do for us. You know, they're very key for our businesses and our for tourism and all that. And they also, everybody is now realizing that they're a key ingredient in climate change, in fighting climate change and the carbon sequestration and carbon storage. And so what that means, uh, so what, you know, obviously you wanna keep your, your amount of trees uh, stable or if not, if not grow the amount of trees in, in the town, that's pretty easily done. Uh, and um, I'd like to educate and that being said, there's, I get a pushback from some of my neighbors when, when we do logging. Uh, some people don't want to see any trees cut and any machinery in the woods or any chainsaws. They freaking out and, you know, I have to explain to them that, that uh, we can't just leave it alone. And some of the woods, actually, I have part of my, we have 110 acres, and I have one parcel that's kind of nice old growth that we never touch. And that's in my forestry plan and that's fine. But for the most part, we want to go in there and keep three uh, three different age classes and uh, keep tree diversity. And in order to do that, you've got to manage it. Mm. Professional foresters and loggers know what they're doing. And it's, um, it's, it's and the products you get out of it are, are tremendous for, uh, for folks. Because if you, if we didn't use wood, for building houses and making furniture and everything else you'd be using plastic and oil and steel and you know yeah. concrete so wood is very useful and, and it's a great commodity and in order to do that you have to log so it's just a great way you know we have to educate people that can still do the carbon thing and the climate change benefits while managing the forests agreed yeah so that's that's sort of what my goal is to, and so we're going to do, I know Ron, uh, we've talked about, he's going to help me get some information up on resources on the town website. And so we'll have, you know, um, descriptions of, of um, where people can go, what websites they can go to for various uh, pieces of information, books, and, and all that stuff. So. Hmm. Sounds like you're the perfect man for that's the job. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking the same thing. <laughs> We're very lucky. <laughs> well, Thank you we, very how much. Did we, yeah, how did we get there, so lucky? There was the guy who was Ron. Who was the who was the the forester who was the tree warden here like ten years ago? Uh, we've had a couple. Jared Nunnery was the most yeah, recent. That's the one I'm thinking of. Yep. Jared Nunnery is a is a professional forester. Yeah. yeah. You know he was awesome. Yeah. But you know he probably doesn't have enough time in his career to be a tree warden in Hyde Park. Yeah. <laughs> He's a real forester. Yeah. I am yeah. not. Yeah. But I know where to find them. No, no, no. That's, all, that's all that matters. Exactly. That's all that matters. Exactly. That's all, that's all, that's I've right. been around a lot of foresters. That's right. Yeah. 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 Well, I think it's a great idea to start to educate people because as you say, you mostly take it for granted, but then something happens. I, I mean, yeah, well, the Amaral Ash Forest is coming. You want to take, yeah, That's yeah. coming to Hyde and, Park. And to start to put stuff on the website so if people have yeah. questions, they can, yeah. you know, it's, it starts them going someplace. Yeah, the, uh, Ron gave me the information on the uh, what the tree board said before for inventory and such. And it was all very well done. And I was happily uh, surprised to see that Hyde Park Village especially and the town as a whole does not have a big ash tree problem. Some of these communities are, it's really bad. Meaning that as the ash trees, as they get infested, um, within five years, most of them are gonna die. And when an ash tree dies, it gets brittle and really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And in the woods, it doesn't mean much. You know, it's not that dangerous in the woods, but next to somebody's house, on next roadways. to municipal <clears throat> roadways, all yeah. that. So there's a lot of towns and cities that are going to have to go out and do a lot of work to keep up with it. Where in Hyde Park, you'll have to do work, but it's it's just a number. There's like two in the village. <laughs> That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then there's a bunch on Garfield Road and, you know, they're around near the roads, but it's not it, it, it a really tall task to deal with them because, you know, as the, as the emerald ash borer comes in, 
I, I actually took the class several years ago as one of the first to take the class down at Waterbury for identification and it's pretty easy to know. I was called out by Raymond Chauvin and James Wood after I took that class because Raymond thought he had it up in Garfield. Something else. Not, so it's not here yet, but it's coming. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. The state put out a bunch of uh, traps, I guess it was. For, uh, and I remember at one of the fish and wildlife sites that yeah. I maintain, um, there was a thing hanging from a tree and a sign yeah. on it. Uh, attached to the tree saying that what it was about to leave it alone and right. uh, and so <clears throat> i never do did know what the results were from that but uh it, there's some uh data out there i would say oh, yeah there's uh and actually the small ash trees you know really like saplings mm -hmm. are probably gonna survive because the infestation will hit and within a couple of years two three years the insects move on and they can only move one, two, three miles a year. It's when when people move firewood, and like everything, don't move wood, don't move wood, you know, and that's where they really move along. But when when they leave an area, like when they hit my wood lot, there's gonna be small ash trees that are gonna survive. And maybe one out of 500 of the big ones, for whatever reason, makes, might survive. So I'm not gonna have to do much in my wood lot. You know, I'm not going to go down and I'm going to harvest more firewood of ash. That's what we're doing now. Um, that's common sense. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But there's not a lot you can do in some places, in some municipal municipal places, or somebody's got gorgeous big old ash trees, you can chemically treat it and arborists come in and chemically treat it. But you have to do it. I don't know if it's once or twice a year and it's a lot of money. And it's like, do you really want to do that? You have to catch it at the right time. Yeah, you got to do it properly and do it all that. And then I've got a, a friend who's another tree farmer. He's up at Sheffield. He was going to do that in his woods. And I was on a Zoom call with him. His name is Al Robertson. He's been like the tree farmer of the year a couple of times up there. He's a phenomenal uh, woods guy. And he was a little concerned about uh, woodpeckers with all the chemicals in the trees. And everybody goes, wow, oh, yeah, that's a good thought. I'm not a thought of that. So, you know, there's different issues to think of mm -hmm. when you use chemicals in these <clears throat> trees, you know. So I'm not going to do it. I, but uh, some pe people like, or certainly uh, it works and for near home or, or beautiful building or something, it would be a good thing to do. But it's, you know, probably going to set you back five or 600 bucks a year or something to keep that tree going, you yeah. know, just for one tree. Yeah. <clears throat> so as a board, how can we support you in your endeavors? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> we'll find out. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> I, no, I, I really don't know. I think uh, I'm happy to talk to folks. Uh, I had uh, Kim and Ron sent me one guy in the village who it, the tree wasn't in the right of way. And he, we sort of knew that, but I went and talked to him and he was worried about the tree falling on his house. and. You know, I sort of laid his fears. I said, yeah, maybe in 10 years or 20, it, it was a kind of multiple stem red maple. And usually they fall down a little bit at a time. And, you know, it didn't look like it was in danger of being tipped over anytime soon. But mm -hmm. So I guess my question is, is it, it's out of the right away and stuff. Is there money for these people that come forward to that there's no money for i would actually that was on a zoom thing i just saw it today they were saying there's not there's really nothing. i mean i didn't know if the oh, state so or not, not, if there's nope. grants or anything or, not that i've heard of but well certainly because some of these yeah. people come forward to, right to, yeah well yeah and even if they if they don't want to pay to keep the tree there um you know they might have to pay someone who knows what they're doing and it's not going to kill themselves taking the tree down. Well, that's, yeah. I didn't, I didn't know if there was. Yeah, no, I, not that I've heard of Roland, but uh, keep our eyes and ears open. You know, it's certainly something that you probably don't want to do as a town because I, Ron was telling me there might be five thousand or so in the budget, but that's yeah for dealing with the trees on the right of way in the village right. and all right. that right. pruning or removing and replanting you know all that stuff costs money but mm -hmm. uh, you know you really want to try to keep the big trees they're so valuable yeah. 
you know, a tree gets that old and that big, they're worth, you know, 50 small trees. It's in, in the carbon and also just in the beauty. And, and if you see a little crown die back or you see a little problem, it's generally nothing to get too worried about. It's worth looking into, but it's, I've had trees that have issues and they just keep going, you know? Yeah. And so like they, you don't want to, yeah. you don't want to take them out. It's, it's not, you don't want to take them out <laughs> just because they have a little problem. Yeah, right. <laughs> Definitely. You just don't, want, Definitely to do don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Because then you end up with a little tree, you get it from buckwheat or something. That's just yeah. like, yeah. It's just not money the same. just for trees. Yeah. And then you got to wait for your children's children to appreciate a big tree. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Dave. Okay. Thank well, you. Thank I, you for your efforts and, and the willingness the to, to work with thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Down, yes, so. very much. Yes. Yes. Great. An Apple, an Apple project at your project. Apple tree release. Yes. Did that, did that come out all right? Oh, yeah. Did you still, is it? We're still, I did some more last year. Yeah, our property is the old, uh, part of the old Whitcomb farm. And the... Uh, so when we moved time. here, uh, Bucky <laughs> told me, oh, yeah, it was Albert Whitcomb. He was known for his variety of apples and all that. And so we've got this meadow near Rodman Brook, the Matt is very familiar with, except his, his uh, tree stand near there. <laughs> and then uh, from the other side of the meadow. Is that baiting? No. Oh, go ahead. No, oh, no, 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 no. I just it's especially it's slipped out. No, exactly. no baiting involved, but the, uh, <laughs> just the proximity is lucky. Yeah, yeah. There you, go. you there can you ask go. your you can ask your old compatriot Dave Gagne about that. Oh, <laughs> and, and Shell. He, 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 he had the other tree right. stand one with Eddie. But the uh, <laughs> so there was there was uh, yeah an apple orchard. So there was the meadow and where the dairy farm was, and then there was an apple orchard. And then there was the old, their, their sugar bush and their woodlands where they got their firewood and got their lumber for their building. So I know sort of where, where everything is on the hillside, uh, you know, sort of historically can see what was, what was what, you know, as far as what was never cleared and, you know, it was always managed and they did a pretty good job. But, uh, He's a great educator. Yeah. 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 Is this what we need? Uh, yeah. Can I get your phone number? I got a question for you, but not to do yeah. here. But yeah. uh, my cell is uh, 802 eight, uh, 371 8678. Yeah. And you yeah. uh, text your voice on that. Yeah. And then Ron and Kim have my own phone number. And all that. Yep. Nope. Well, okay. I'll be reaching out to you at some point. Certainly. Great. Great. Thank you very evening. much. And thank you. Welcome. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Next on the agenda is uh, Hyde Park uh, Fireworks. You can go for Ann Lancaster's number. Ron, did we get any feedback from the. Uh... Yeah. Remember, you're being recorded. <laughs> yeah. I always have a phone call. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm okay with it. From the front porch forum, um, and then the paper, or whatever we did. Yeah, there was uh, two comments uh, that I received. <clears throat> the just, uh, they're both about the same, but I'll read one uh, from Jessica, uh, if you want me to. It's relatively short. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hello. <laughs> I have a couple of questions. I'm a native Floridian and cute fireworks for holidays were always a tradition in my house, meaning small maximum six foot high fountain ones that omit pretty colors, a few noises, but are not to the magnitude of reaching power lines or ear splitting boomers at town displays. No canisters, no mortars, et cetera. It's been a big debate in our house over this and what is and what is not allowed. Last year, I was under the impression that these small displays are perfectly fine, but was met with rude, snide comments on Front Porch Forum. Could you please explain what we are legally allowed to have for entertainment on our street and what is not allowed? And that is, that's sort of the slippery slope question about <clears throat> people wanting to do something at holidays and celebrations or weddings and having sort of three different categories of uh, 
fireworks at their disposal, whether they go up to East Montpelier at North Star Fireworks, or whether they go south and buy them down south and bring them back up here. The exemption under Vermont law allows a lot of the things that she was just talking about, uh, the smoke snakes and little sparklers and things like that, um, that are pretty innocuous. You get them at the grocery store. Uh, the second level is the consumer displays, which are loud, like can be very loud, can be very high, but are regulated by the amount of gunpowder. And then the third one is the public displays done by contractors, which the select board prohibited last year. So we're sort of stuck in that middle group. Um, Jessica, for example, she could continue to do whatever she can buy at the grocery store. That, that would probably be my answer to her because that's allowed by state law. The middle ground is the one that the Supreme Court case last year raised some concerns about whether towns can even legally issue a permit to encourage the consumer display. And those we do about four to six a year. Um, and those are the ones that we've dealt with, as long as I've been in Hyde Park, uh, where they get too close, the wind blows the wrong way, animals get scared, uh, kids are nervous, dogs are nervous, uh, which goes and competes against, hey, it's July 4th, of course you're going to have fireworks, we got to celebrate July 4th. Then you have those two, two, two basic competing camps. Uh, the legal issue that was raised, um, Woolcut has been the most vocal on Front Porch Forum, and I did talk to Linda Martin last week uh, about the prohibition, basically, that towns can only issue local fireworks permits through the fire chief for the large public displays, which are now prohibited in Hyde Park, or a retail store permit, so somebody could sell them if they get all their federal permits. And that's those are the only two categories that the Supreme Court clearly said towns have the right to do. Um, I haven't been able to ask or find out what the number of towns are that are still issuing fireworks permits for consumer displays, whether that matters to you or not, I could definitely spend time on that. Uh, whether it's a purely a legal issue and uh, the select board checks it out with the town attorney and the town attorney says, absolutely, if somebody gets a permit from the fire chief and you're, you're issuing a permit and encouraging it and that somebody gets injured and because you're a part of the encouragement then the town's liable and the insurance company says you're not covered because you're doing something that isn't supported by law that's the worst case scenario uh, the the other case is that it's still murky a lot of towns do it you do four or six you know four to six a year uh, maybe you do a little more pr which is what we tried to do put more notices out when you do issue a permit um, and that's kind of where we're sitting. That's why when Brian was uh, and I were talking about it, we anticipating July 4th and what I, I don't want to be put in the position again of having that um, sort of the competing of facts of the matter uh, and, and not have a discussion with the select board. So Brian said, put it in front porch forum, see what the community thinks. And the two responses I got was, you know, this one, uh, yes, I like the small ones and uh, the other comment was, I like the consumer ones. Why can't we continue to do that? So uh, we didn't get a big outcry from anybody else, uh, farmers or, or people that had complained directly to us before because they were disturbed uh, during the event. We didn't get those comments back, but we have those on record from before last year saying, please ban all fireworks. So anyway, that's, that's where we're at. That's a kind of a quick summary, but it is back to you to evaluate that um, uh, uh, sort of the authority or encouragement for the fire chief to continue doing permits or to discourage that practice. Do you know, Ron, <clears throat> I don't do much with fireworks myself or any, maybe anybody else. On the package, is there a decibel listed on there for the sound of the noise? I don't know if it could be read. Uh, regulated somehow by the decibels? Um, anything that is commercially available at North Star that has anything over a couple hundred grams will be beyond anybody's decibel meter, probably. <laughs> so it's, it's, not, it's not a matter of the decibel as much as it is how close it is to the sensitive people in town. And with so many more houses scattered all over town, it's harder to find any place that's sort of distant from other homes now. 
Yeah, I we think that, that's partly where the conflicts are happening. Yeah. So we leave it to the fire chief to issue the permit, or do we want to put some other guidance in place, <laughs> suggestions? I'm a huge fan of fireworks, so I, 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 I yeah, I understand. we buy them at North Star every year and we let them off at our camp in Hardwick every year. All That's the time. Hardwick. All no, year I'm long. talking about Hardwick. No. So apparently <laughs> Hardwick, Hardwick, Hardwick allows it, apparently. I we, totally understand like Lucas Lampier and stuff. I understand yes. the concerns. So I think that it's a courtesy thing, but I, I think that that could be released through Front Porch Forum or maybe if we're going to allow them, then you be a notification list, you know, saying, hey, we are going to issue a permit but we have to notify X, Y, Z in order to issue that permit. Actually, Ron, do you think that's why maybe you didn't get some responses from people because you were better about the communication when that when that big, let's call it episode happened when people weren't informed that year and it did affect the farm? You know, that was a pretty big deal, but I think you're, I think the communication when permits are given is really great now. And I think people are more aware. Do you? I think they're expecting it now. So if you were to continue the fireworks um, permits for the consumer displays, I would de we would definitely make sh have to make sure we continue that. That's usually one or two notices in Front Porch Forum. Plus, there's a short list of five people, I think, that have specifically asked for notice. So sure. like a phone, phone call or email type thing. Yeah. Uh, there are precautionary measures that they can take, most of them. Um, with notice, but obviously at you know nine o'clock at night and not being aware, they they generally don't have that chance to prepare. Right, and you didn't do, or we I shouldn't say you, we didn't do the communication prior, correct? That was something kind of you stepped up. Uh, last couple of years, yeah, just yeah. just just the last couple of years. Before then, the fire chief would sign the permit, tell the landowner to call the sheriff the day of, I think. And then uh, the permit would just be filed at the town clerk's office. Yeah, yeah I think the communication is key for sure. Is there a time limit on any of them when we issue a permit? Oh, I don't know. They, yeah, they, have, to provide, they have to provide the specific day and hour that they're gonna have the display. Okay. Now, how much time does it take? Because if you're gonna put it in front porch forum, you wanna uh, lease a day, right? Uh, prior or warning? Or even a couple. Well, yeah, there, there's a there's a lead time on the permit um, to give people notice. It's I think it's five days. So I can't remember exactly, but there is a lead time where we haven't had that uh, problem. Two two days notice generally. Uh, people, I, I would think most people know July Fourth weekend or the weekend before is a risky time if they are sensitive uh, to make some you know prepare, preparations. Um, having the additional front porch forum notice is helpful in case they sort of forget that, you know, if July 4th is on a Wednesday, you could have two weekends in a row sometimes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you said that people can put their names on a list. You mentioned. Yeah. Thing, yeah I try, I try, I just started building like a, a it's relatively small uh, email list so that people know the the day, time and address. The permit holder is only required to notify the adjoining property owners and that doesn't really work well for you know fireworks that are a few hundred feet in the air right yeah so it's it's more of how do you get the notice to everybody and of course some people are going to be missed they don't look at front porch every day or they don't get the notice from the because they're not an immediate adjoiner uh, that so those people will still be impacted yeah So do we want to leave it as is with the notification of the fire, uh, fire chief? Has the fire chief expressed any concerns? No, he's, I think he was just waiting for direction. We've, I've kept him in the loop on the discussions and um, he on his own could decide not to issue if he thinks he's doing right. it against some kind of case law or whatever. But right now the, yeah. the process is they would go to him first, um, chief carrier, yeah. Okay. Well, you could also end up where, you know, we have this remarkable dry spell and fireworks right. and fire hazards. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Don't, don't make sense. Like which right is, now. Yeah, which is, I, just, <laughs> yeah. I can't believe how fast The, the commercial really ones, they, they require that uh, the ground be cleared for a certain amount of feet. We used right. to do that for uh, for the ones in Morrisville. The work crew would go in there and just cut down everything that was around for so it many feet. So it wouldn't, spark uh, or yeah, whatever. it wouldn't uh, start a fire fast. It was controllable. 
So, but, but we're still not doing. We're still not allowing the gigantic things. That's right. Right. Um, and and again, when we went through this, learning a lot about fireworks, but it's particularly the great big ones. It's not so much an issue with these smaller ones, but for the animals, it isn't. So it's the percussion as opposed to the noise that with your gigantic fireworks, there's a real percussive wave apparently. And that tends to be as startling and upsetting to the animals as the noise is to the animals. That's why a lot of them don't get as upset with these, you know, the smaller ones that we're, that we're talking about. And, it, and it's not, again, it's, it, it's not this gigantic ongoing percussion of noise and sound and everything that's going on for them, which is, a, again, I had a lot of talk with farmers and horse people about that with the when we were trying to come up with it. Ron, does that have to be a motion? No, the, the policy right now would be continued without change from last year where the applicants would uh, make a stop at the fire chief and the fire chief would make a decision. Usually that's a, a, a kind of a check on that fire safety due to the uh, sure. dry, dryness and then I think most people that have gotten permits in the past already know about the separation to structures and things like that. So they they know what the requirements are from uh, the other concern, which is um, distance to homes and things that the fire chief checks off. Sure. Getting a permit information. Okay. Yeah. So just yeah, just the discussion in the record that we revisited, keep the status quo, keep the pro prohibition on commercial, and carry on. Okay. Yeah. With, with the public notice conditions that we try our best doing that. Yeah. 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 Okay. The ARPA project uh, ideas, um, open discussion. So basically, we got this money, and uh, we need to get some ideas of. Uh, from the public and, and where to spend it, that type of different projects, that type of thing. Anybody got any ideas? Oops. Name the playground. Right, badly. Up in our community, up in our sports facility. Where's the one that's there now, right next to, you're talking up there in, in Garfield. Yeah. yeah. When I was painting up there, I remember looking over at that and uh, our insurance company deemed all the equipment. I was going to say, is it even there? Yeah. Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So basically, you're going to model after what the schools have? We, as a group, have talked about it a lot. We just want to start with the swing set, but we, we're working off of funds that we just generated ourselves. So it's the, those type of equipment is expensive. Yes. Like just a regular structure, just a single place structure is like nine grand. Yeah. I still don't understand how Roland and I survived swinging on swings when we were mm -hmm. younger. That's all I, we want right I now. I did too. We're you to, don't have to. Get swing. Yeah. We're trying to get swing. That's what we want. Oh, well, metal slides. slides. The, the, the ones back in no, our day, no. they were rusty from the sweat of the hand. And we used to <laughs> stick our tongue on it and get it stuck to it. And, and you didn't do that. I know you didn't. Okay. No, I don't think I did. Okay, that. see? See, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so. There's one idea, Ron. A swing set. Where does that use up all the money? You did send a list. But yeah, I was, I'm, I'm, not, I'm like, no, I can't find it. Yeah, I'm not finding any of the right stuff on that I had. Yeah, it's on the it's on the home page of the website. If you can go there, it's just uh, it's been oh, posted. Right. But didn't it, you email it to us? Yeah, you did. Yeah, okay. and there was questions about whether we wanted to spend it to the community or like community involvement, right? Or yeah, the regional regional piece so yeah the the list that we've kind of taken notes on over the last six eight months is on the home page uh it doesn't it, i don't think it includes playground equipment it can if we have a budget number of you know twenty thousand or some some number to plug in there that would be good no, no, yeah, i yeah, think we do come up with a couple of ideas no here's there's, the swings yeah, and here's at, the at the bottom of our list there's 20 grand yeah i was gonna okay. say there's a list on there for the Rec committee because right, right, right. I emailed it to Ron. Yeah. I know it's on there, Ron. Yeah. Which which had the play playground? I yeah, think it was like twelve grand or thirteen grand. And I've done a basketball. Do it. You want to update a basketball hoop? Yeah. I remember Erica sending that letter? So that's actually already in there, Ron. Okay. So they should write up a proposal. They are like they, they they she are, already did. Yeah, I did all of that. Yeah. Good. Good. I just need the money so I get before the like the summer yeah. ends. The summer ends. Yeah. You don't want to use it during the middle of winter time. Correct. Okay. 
Yeah, we actually, are using, we are using tap as a socket facility, so it's getting used <laughs> yeah. a lot more now than it ever has. Yeah, I have that proposal. Yeah, the playground amenities uh, are in the well. It's it's a, it's actually everything. It's equipment to maintain fields, playground amenities, field and playground improvements, twenty thousand. Yeah. I don't know if that's a good number. That's what my question was. If Matt's been working on it, maybe there's a better number to plug in there. I can get. I can make it more. Yeah, I think I think it's better to think high. And and let the board decide in the end. Do it in stages anyway. Yeah. And then there's I, I a long term plan. We, we have all those estimates broke down. We had the basketball court, the pavement numbers on it, the, 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 the new fence. I have all of that stuff. I really like to see you know a good portion of it's spent on uh, drawing people into the businesses that we have here in town to support the businesses and generate maybe even more business if we uh, can. Now we've got. The new restaurant, and what's going in where uh, uh, the furniture store was? It, or, no no uh, one knows. MSI was doing something with them, or were they, or something? MSI is doing a variety of things. They don't know. They don't know. <laughs> no. <they're... laughs> it's a secret. It's, it's, it's gone from housing to office space to, uh, he, you know, he's, so there's a, but something eventually is going to happen to it. So no permits have been filed? That is a question for the village zoning administrator. Okay. <laughs> I'm not in that. I'm not in that loop. She, I will see some things come through Act 250 from time to time or state stormwater permits, but there's been no action for eight months, maybe. Yeah. They had original plan early in 21 for a new street to connect Eden Street to Main Street. That, and they bought the house on Eden Street to make that happen. But no, only a really rough sketch is what all I saw. And that's probably getting on a year by now. I think with the growing, how fast Marshall's growing, it's going to kind of overlap into Hyde Park, and I think we need to be prepared for that. And maybe this FEMA money can can create the uh, ARPA money. Right. Yeah, I'm not, I mean, no, yeah. no, ARPA. Well, it isn't sort of as as I've said. I think John and Judy Kaiser would sell that corner lot. Um, and you were thinking parking or something you said? Well, or, or you make it a park or, you know, you could, you could do a variety of things. Anytime things are done in the village, that space always gets used anyway. Um, they had the they had the cleanup site stuff done before and said we'd look at that, but that it's okay that that was taken care of. Which one is theirs? Right on the corner of the old garage. Oh, right, right, right across from the courthouse. Yes. Okay. And, and again, if you think long term and right now and people are doing things, you know, in the village houses and everything's getting, you know, it's really, it's looking nice, mm -hmm. you know, it, it, it really is. And that's really looks pretty crummy. <laughs> and again, it, as another little pocket park, the, the one, the pocket park they did across from the library, rolling all that cement you guys did, it obviously paid off. It looks really nice. All the daffodil bulbs are up there now. It looks, it looks great in the village. Good right job, Roland. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I poured the concrete. Oh, that's right. He was tromping around in there, right? No, that was <laughs> Dave. That was, was Dave. Dave. <laughs> now, a lot of this money, Ron, we have to use for, um, like it's the HVAC open. ventilation, that kind of stuff, right? That stuff's kind of important to get done. Yeah. There there's a there's a short list that matches the original goals of ARPA pretty quickly, which is employees, okay. employee safety, air ventilation, anything related to the pandemic that um, right. will help in the next round. And then they loosened up the standards to allow more economic development and uh, recreation and things like that. So it's a pretty broad, um, broad brush at this point. The um, Next meet information on the on the air circulation stuff and everything because we were looking at the library as well. Right. Yes, the the combination of three HVAC buildings, which um, is maybe the only way we can get a contractor interested, 
would be the library, town office, and garage done under one contract. Yeah. And that's a big enough project, and it's just technical enough that I would hire or recommend hiring a, a clerk of the works or project manager to do all that. Yeah. They'll be busy sometimes, but then need, you know, day by day attention on other times. And I, I, I don't know how to make sure that happens right, but it's, it's been done wrong in some of the buildings already. And I, I think if we're going to invest in that kind of improvement, we should really do it right with some oversight. Uh, all of it's ARPA eligible, you know, through that fund. The other use that I've heard some towns taking advantage of is called land bank banking, which is buying properties now or, or securing a lease for future purchase so that uh, people, so people can continue to use their property, but the town has a first right of refusal or the town uh, buys it and then leases it back to people for future public use, those kind of things. So you don't have to come up with the exact use, but you can secure properties now with the ARPA money. At your next meeting on the 24th, Katie Buckley from VLCT will be here to give you some more of those kind of details about what you can and can't use your money for. Uh, she's also gonna bring some examples from other towns uh, to give you some more ideas, but um, I'm not, the clock's not exactly ticking, but um, you have to designate or uh, choose your projects by December 24. So just prior to that, if we could put something in the front porch form, it would uh, perk some interest with uh, uh, the people in the community so that they uh, are able to hear that information to you know, spur some suggestions as well. I wanna get as many people interested in it and get as many people from the, from the Hyde Park to be vocal. Yeah, that was, that was a quick discussion I had with Katie about, you know, if you hit, hit up people and say, what are your ideas? And that's all you ask. You may not get much back. If you say, we're thinking of spending a hundred thousand on X, what do you think? You might get more opinion. So it's kind of the two ways to, to get it uh, back for your um, consideration. I think if you use both methods where you say, Hey, by the way, the 24th of May, we're going to have a, uh, a, not an expert, but a, uh, uh, an ARPA uh, consultant. consultant or assistant talk to the select board about what to do with our $740,000. Please try to attend if possible with your ideas. That's one way. The other way is to say, hey, the list is posted on the website and we're looking for more projects. Check that out and you know add yours for consideration. So there's kind of, I don't know what people respond to. A lot of times people wait until there's like legs under a project and then they say yes or no to it. So it's, it's sort of like, I, I think Brian, I think you're right. Just as you go through your process, keep putting the announcements out there and people will decide to jump in or, or not at some point. Yeah, that continued education. Okay, is that it for ARPA? Yeah, I think that we just want to keep it on each agenda, um, like yep. you said, just to keep it on there. And approval of the vendor list. Uh, the vendor list is an annual, by policy, an annual step that the select board does um, to confirm that you're not against or not willing, that you're, that you're willing to work with everybody on the list. In other words, our contractor list or vendor list is nine pages long post on the finance page it includes um you know uh, people that work for the town people that uh, like aflac all the way to american red cross all the way down to uh, brookfield service who does the generators any anybody like that it lists their name and and phone number sometimes but that's all that's on the list if any select board member has an issue with any vendor in particular, and you're like, hey, we should, we, that, that company's not treating somebody right, or we've had issues with them somehow, maybe, maybe we should not put them on this list, then that would prevent departments from working with those vendors. On the flip side, because you approve the list every April, the community, other vendors, as well as department heads know that the town has got a decent working relationship with everybody on the list. And some people might say, hey, I'm thinking about working with um, uh, Brook Valley Farm. 
maybe I'll do that if I see that the town works with them from time to time, you know, those kind of things. So yeah. it's not a huge critical piece to this, but if they're on the list, they have all their paperwork in order so that we can pay the invoice. That's one use. And the second use is that these folks on here uh, are approved by the board to do business with the town, just generally. So I don't, I don't know how you want to do it in the past. Pe if people had a concern of a vendor, we just look on the list to see if they were there and not really debate each of the nine pages, so to speak. If somebody wants to be on that list, what do they do? Uh, generally, they will say, and usually it happens when there's business going to, that there's business sure. going to happen. So a department head will look at the list, find out that the company they're thinking about isn't on the list. And then Jennifer, generally, uh, as the finance manager would say, oh, yes, I, I, I confirm that they're not on our approved vendor list. I need their W-9 or certificate of insurance if they're going to work on town property. Once she gets that information and conf confirms all the documents, they get added to the, um, added to the list. And then every April, the select board gets a chance to look at the full list and, and let another year go by. So it is edited as needed. Uh, Krista in the town clerk's office went through and deleted uh, people that had no business with the town for three years so that we sort of purged the list, if you will, of, of people that just weren't doing business with the town anymore. Um, so it's a relatively current list now. We're still looking at it every, every time we do invoices because sometimes an issue pops up. Um, typically it's a certificate of insurance that's uh, expired or maybe the W-9 was never filed properly and then we'll go get that to update the record. So like I said, if you, in the past, we haven't gone through the whole list, but if any board member has an issue that they know of a contractor or vendor in the area that we maybe want to talk about um, or call them in to discuss an issue, then that this is a good time to do that. So do we need a motion to keep the current list? Yes, that would be the annual vote to approve the vendor list for 2022. Um, it's, it's on the, by policy, it's supposed to be done every April, but if you wanna take more time, you could do it the 24th of May if you wanna defer it. Anybody got any questions, issues? Yeah, I'm looking at it. Can get a motion? Just sure, I will move to approve the vendor list. In the second? 2022 vendor list. In the second? I'll second it. All in, uh, yeah, all in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. I'll say aye. I haven't reviewed it. But... Trust me. Okay. Trust me. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> you can still add to this, right, though? Right. Oh, yeah. If business yeah. comes yeah. up. Right. Exactly. We're not, we're not shutting anybody out. Yeah. Yep. The ayes yep. appear to have it. Anybody opposed? Abstaining? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Next thing is what? The highway uh, department matters. The first thing on the list is uniforms. And there's been a huge jump in the price, the cost, or, or there was an issue too about the uniforms coming back kind of dirty. There's been all sorts of uh, issues. I think it's a big company that processes a lot of uniforms in Vermont and they have a system that um, is, is relatively consistent. I don't think there's a delivery and pickup issue when the cleanings are needed. It's more the details and the fine print, if you will. So talking to Highway, they, they would like to go out for a, just a second quote to see if anybody out there can sort of beat them. Uh, there's only two, two that I know of. This is, this is the Sintas uh, agreement, and I can't think of the other name, but they're just the two companies that service the area. Universe still in business? Universe is one you want to know. Yeah. Universe yeah. is really expensive. I do this at work, and Centos is really expensive in everything they do. With the first aid medical, they're, they're triple Universe. Oh, sure. Yeah, they started, it was like the switch, not a switch and bait exactly, but we started off at about $100 a week to, you know, $90 to $110 a week, and now we're around 200 a week, which is above our budget amount. How many, how many uniforms was that? Each guy gets a, a, well, Mark, I think Mark's online. He could chime in, but I think it's a full week's clothes um, that go out. So there's like two full sets. 
they just rotate them well one's getting cleaned the other they have five days left at the shop i think ours is 13 dollars a person bi weekly yeah that's pretty it's pretty close to that the problem we have is they sold us in the beginning uh they basically an insurance add-on insurance writer and it was so much a week it wasn't that much as i don't know, say 25 bucks a week or something that's for what rips and tears and stains. Yeah, rips and tears that, and replacements, and we were, we were doing that whether or not we had any rips or tears. And the guys are pretty good about their clothing. Yeah, sometimes they'd spill oil or you know have a tear or something like that. But generally, they they were not making a big use of the insurance uh, rider. Of course, we we said, hey, well, since we're not using it much, let's save you know 25, 30 bucks a week, whatever it was. And immediately, not immediately, probably about six months later, you would see these charges of 40 and 50 bucks for a new shirt or new pants or whatever. And the highway guys were like, we didn't send anything back that needed to be replaced. So we're, we kind of lose control at pickup of the uniform. And then we'll get charged because somebody at Syntas was, oh, this is bad enough to replace. Let's charge them for a brand new you know, setup. So that's where, uh, if you if you look at the invoices, which are, you know, a couple pages long, you can see uh, a shirt here, pants there, added on to your weekly charge. Push it, you know, sometimes like two fifty a week, and then you start saying, "Geez, a washing machine is two fifty a week." You know, it's like. So anyway, that was our conversation with Highway that we did, they've gone. Uh, now we get the fuel sur surcharge, which everybody's putting on, and it's. I think it's time to at least get a quote from Unifirst. And I, I think Matt's right. I think there's only two companies that will do this to, to go to the shop and pick up stuff. What's the uh, yearly charge? You know what that is for, for the uniforms? Uh, I think we had seven. Well, we had seven or 8,000 in the budget and we're pushing 10. 10,000. How about uh, if we approach them as a union type thing? and uh, propose a stipend for clothing. Yeah, all, all of that stuff is a discussion that um, I don't recall how we started with uniforms. I think it's been in place for a long time. There used to be three or four vendors maybe way back when, but the two big companies have taken over. So if, if there's other op options like a stipend or uh, wash your clothes at home and or wash your clothes at the shop and change your clothes at the shop, all, th those would need a lot of discussion because it changes uh, just, you know just the practical discussion of how that all happens yeah the union issue uh, i don't know because how it's a benefit that they're receiving yeah i don't know how clear it is in the union contract about what it means to have a uniform so we'd have definitely have to deal with that issue but um we just because of the cost we have to talk about it at least so it's, hey, Roland? A, it's a benefit in the contract uh, but i could check them to I don't care if it's a benefit or not. We want our town employees in nice uniforms that recognize who they are. Right. Hey, one of the one of the other issues, uh, Roland, that I dealt with in the army side is if somebody takes spills kerosene on their uniform and takes it home and washes their kids' clothes with their uniform, it yeah. suddenly becomes a ta uh, an issue with the work clothes, and that's why most places go to uniforms is to get away from that liability or have a washing machine at work, obviously. Right. Um, but you have to buy the uniforms if you do that. Um, that's just my thoughts on it. Yeah. Ron? Yep. That, uh, so some of that too is our rags, the shop rags. Right. That I think you just cut down and our oil absorbent rags. So we don't have to do the speedy dry and figure out how to get rid of the speedy dry. We have the oil absorbent rags which will pull oil out of water or whatever. I mean, the water stays and the oil's all in the rags. So some of that's, you know, part of just shop as well, not just the uniform. Yeah. Oh, so that two hundred dollars isn't just uniform. Is that what you're saying? No, so it should be our regular shop rags that we're kind of like out of now because it was got cut, and our oil absorbent they're yeah. like rugs that are using Speedy Dry. Which picks up, you know, there could be there's slush and everything falling off a truck. You can put that down and just pull the oil out, and the water stays. 
Oh, yeah, like that kitty litter too? Is that what you it's like a, it's like a wall. It's like you throw it down and it, it, it draws them, but it holds them and lets the water stay out. Got it. Yeah, so the con the contract with the uh, local IBEW 300, which is in place now, re section 15.1 requires the town to uh, contract and pay for cleaning of uniforms. So we, we have to figure out how to control the costs. Give another price. Yeah. I, I think we just had Mark get reach out and see if he can get some numbers. I'll do a little bit of research on my end too. And I can, if I can get some numbers, I'll send them to Roland and Roland can share them with Mark. Yeah, that seems. You yeah, that's a good, that's I do a good think, idea. Matt, I do think there was a difference. I think we looked at it a while ago. I think there's a difference for how many employees you have too. Oh, as, I know so that we're a small school. I think Morseville was cheaper than we were because Morseville had so many more guys uh, to the same company. Could you share a contract that. with exactly with, with, with Morrisville? I, I mean, because they're not the same place. <laughs> Still, a stop probably. I think, I think you're getting into budgets here. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I'm just trying to save money. Yeah. Hmm. But can you can you Ron that when you said two hundred dollars a week now that isn't just uniforms that's the rags too right. Yeah, if you if you took well the rags are sort of a bottom line you know 20 or 30 bucks every once in a while it's oh, not okay. the driving the driving piece is the replacement of uniform pieces that we don't have control over so even if the highway guys could live with a tear in their left arm sleeve <laughs> you know the the company's going to repair it or replace the thing for no 50 matter. bucks yeah Funny, I bet those same rips were there when you had the insurance rider, but they probably didn't replace them. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I know. I think Mark said that sometimes they come back with tears that they don't remember having on their uniform. So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Mike got one back last week with no, or two weeks ago with no sleeve. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah, there you go. So I'll leave it to Matt and uh, Roland to, to do a little investigation. We'll revisit and when we can. I, ju I just get a price from Uniforms. Yeah. yeah good start yeah and then the other company will say hey i'm going to get a price from uniforms and then they'll cut the price yeah. there you go yeah. <laughs> play the game I yeah 100 they're going to lose you so, okay so like that was uniforms ones. now we're going to discuss gps for the equipment yeah i mean we're supposed to. We we're supposed to hear back from Mark and the guys are talking about that. I haven't heard nothing of you, Mark, from the. I well, I called a guy today to see he's going to send a quote, a full quote, I guess, on the setup, and he's supposed to send it to me by the end of the day today, and I still haven't got it. This is this is more of a safety feature than anything, you know. Get out there, you get plowing, and it's more of a safety thing. I don't think it's much of a safety issue because no, you know, I'm not going to be. I, I got to be out plowing too. It's not like I'm sitting here monitoring and watching, and you know what I mean. So it's not really a safety uh, issue when you, when per you, se. When you get in an accident, you know, then things can help you. When you go out, and people say. Well, they're not out. That thing will tell you that you're out, you know? So you can go back in the data and look at everything and, and, and not have no questions. I don't have to go back in data. I know we're out. <laughs> well, this, this is tangible. Yeah. It's tangible evidence. Mark, is there something you're looking at wanting? What's that? Something you're wanting, right? No, the select board has brought it. No, up. the select board wants it. I just, I don't, I don't see the myself personally. I don't see adding the extra cost right now. The way times are, but that's just me. Put it to uniforms. We can't afford our uniforms, and but right. we're going to be able to afford to put eighteen dollars a yeah. month per vehicle and equipment. I, that's the part we, I don't get right at this time. And we can't even afford fuel. Right. I was going to say that. So, so we'll know where the trucks are. <laughs> right. Sitting in the garage. So, so where are we at with this GPS? So, okay. Waiting for a quote. We're waiting. Okay. And this is something we, yeah. as a board, are looking for? Yeah. Okay. 
And well, the board had some, the board, some, get, some, we, some of the once, board. Once we get some it, of the board, once we get right. it, well, we can vote it down or vote it up. Okay. All right. All right. All yeah, right. I don't. Has, I don't think it's been voted on yet. Or no, no. but we ain't got yet. No. So I, I, don't, I think we're on to the next question, right? Matt, do you have it on any of your equipment, the GPS? We have on on our equipment. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's more production for us, or it's more insurance liability for us. Um, yeah. If if we are in a car, you could see the G forces, or you could see that he was being reckless, or you could see that he wasn't. You know, it's, it does it, it. Is it helpful? Sure. Well, we also have some guys that like sitting in the office and like to put their hand over the top of it. I also have five trucks sitting right now with no operators in them. So if a guy feels like he's watched and feels like he you can't trust him. Yeah, I think the, the only input I have, which I've said before, is the two pieces that would make uh, a big a big financial impact is the accountability and tracking for grant reimbursement purposes. When you have really good data, you get uh, quicker reimbursement and potentially more reimbursement from grant agencies when you have that good data. And the second one is what uh, Matt just said, which is if there's an incident on the road, we have good, uh, basically firsthand knowledge by that uh, tracking of what exactly happened, how fast somebody was going, et cetera. So we'll wait and revisit it at the next meeting when we'll have some data or have some. Yeah, I think I think what Matt, what Mark said is they'll, they'll have a formal proposal based on our prior conversations with a full cost and then the board can vote it up or down. Okay. And then the next one's what, Center Road? Loan? Yeah, they're, they're supposed to go this week, right, Mark, on that and refix that? Well, he's, he's hoping for Friday. Friday, Friday, yeah. yeah. Are you talking about the only thing? The only thing is with it is that crown is probably going to be off a little bit because you're going to be adding, you know, they're going to overlay one lane, so it might mess the crown up a little bit for about 100 feet. I don't think that matters. The possibility. I think you know, they're going to key in, so they're going to do three keys. Yes. They're, they're going to do three keys, then uh, do an overlay. They're doing what? Do you overlay with a butt joint. Yeah. Same thing. Yeah. So yeah. the, the adhesion below is not an issue? Tap fire. They'll put down a tap. Right. They better put down a tap layer. Yeah. 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 No, they'll tack it. Cool. If there's other areas around they it. Know, they, they tap the whole thing. So okay. They'll tack the whole thing. In that spot? Yeah, yeah. If they're doing an overlay, they'll tack it. Same thing they do when they're... Yeah, they'll right. put a motion down and save it. But they're going to do three keys, one along the center line and one at the start and end point. So that side of the road will actually be lifted a little bit over the other lane. What's where's the location of this, Mark? Right there after the intersection. Just up from your house or above the corner, there's two little potholes. Yeah, fire and right. just blue house. Yeah. Has anyone gone down through that road? Because from I found three potholes walking it this week. You might want to just make sure that it's not more than just by my place. I haven't been up there since month ago where it repeats that same pothole repeats way up by Dave Gagne's house too. Did you know that Mark? I haven't seen the one by Dave's house. There's a spot there's, that I don't like just above the four corners. Yeah, so it, yeah, there's two, there's two, there's two, there's two small yeah, the, potholes. The little ones are actually that big. But I don't know where. <laughs> it's it's like like Tenny Hill yeah. or something, so right in that area. I'll have to look at it again. This one I'm thinking of is after, just north of the four corners. When's the warranty uh, run out? It uh, should be a year. Right. I think it's a year. Which would be this yeah. fall. This winter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's coming winter. <laughs> okay. So um, did you want to talk about the loan part of it, Ron? Yes, I can do that. The um we did get some grants and we do have the um, voter approved 75,000 from town meeting day to help. And the $912,000 that's due now, which is the end of the one year was the 900 principal plus 12,000 interest. 
the lounge that is on the table somewhere needs three or more select board member signatures to approve a, another one year term for 594,000, which would be um, right. paid by uh, either next year's paving money, a, uh, some FEMA reimbursement money that we're expecting and anything else that we can figure out to try to pay that off next year. There'll have to be some creative um, work by uh, the new finance uh, administrative manager and myself and the board, but I think the goal is to not see a third year of this project. Uh, not not easy to do, but that's the goal is to get rid of this within the uh, within the next year. Ron, just just out of curiosity, I saw when we signed off on the, the, the monthly. Why was there two? Why was there two installments to Union Bank on that one that equal that amount? Like why three hundred and six thousand and then an additional twelve thousand? Yeah, the um, when you're booking loan payments, you have basically a principal payment and the interest expense is a, a separate line item. So you track the two debts separately. Okay, I didn't, see, I couldn't see the, that why. I just, I'm, I'm new to the game, learning. No. Yeah, no, there's, you always have your principal so you know how much you borrow, then you always have your interest total to so, know how much extra you spent, <laughs> I guess. Right. <laughs> So you do have the full board signature on on that now. So yeah, if you can just have a motion to approve the allonge with Union Bank for five hundred ninety four, um, that would be good. So move. Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? The ayes have it, Ron. Right, thank you. You can leave that with the warrant, and uh, Kim yep. will take care of that in the morning. Yep. Okay. So. Susan had raised a question about changing a class four to class three road. Well, right. How, yeah. how are people, and it's interesting, and I know Woken is going through this right now too, with them um, as, and again, it serves you know, as people are expanding and people are coming out and it looks good. And of course the Diggins road has been our forever <laughs> that we, that we talk about, but as, as there's interest and there's, there's some folks up there now, um, getting ready to build a, uh, um, a real, a, a lovely home. And, um, but as people start building, I'm sure they're doing it on the assumption that the town is eventually going to take up the road. And if we don't have anything clear about that, you know, that we are, or we aren't, um, can we talk about this? You can zone in by the way. Were you not? Was she not that she wasn't here. Yes, yeah, she wasn't here. I was okay. like, yeah, we had a huge discussion on okay. this. Okay, I was like, wait. Is okay. this so thing? what did what are okay. we doing? We so if you had a big discussion, tell we me did. what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, it depends on the, the zoning uh, bylaws and stuff like that. Right. And if they have to bring the road up to, uh, if they want it at a class three uh, road, then they have to bring it up. To a class three, then we that's uh, before, before the town accepts it. They, yeah, right. It's okay, owner right. So culvert right. ditching right. and that's all that. Yeah, that's a state law. Well, that's yeah. a state law, right? And actually, so I hate to say this because I know there was a lot of discussions on it, but actually, a class four road you don't have to plow, and I think the town and right. board has been pretty lenient on that. Yes, yes, you know, yeah. which, but, which is where people then very pragmatically take it the next step that assuming well if you're plowing it you're going to take care of it i mean that's not an illogical if it's a class three road oh, well but that's not an illogical assumption on the class fours that we're plowing if if it was up to me years ago when this all come up when i was on the board i would have shut it off then and said I'm... oh class four roads are not going to be plowed in the wintertime. Yep. That's what I, I did say that. Yeah. And somebody cocked up like a rooster. And <laughs> <laughs> no. Just share my opinion. Now. I, get, I give a little bit of, I mean, people pay a lot of money in taxes in this town. I do. I don't want to <laughs> take that away from some people who are paying the taxes. You know, what benefit do they get? And, they and we have. Money. Yeah. And right. So I, I want to make sure that we're not. But legally, the state says you do not have to plow class four roads. And you are supposed to maintain them like twice a year on right, the grade. Right. Like Cooper and the water. Yeah. Right. Yeah. 
Right. And it's just as, and my question is though, is when people, because there are a lot of lots up there. So when they start selling and people start building homes, it's, at some point, sure, come on, shouldn't, shouldn't we let them know that just because you get a permit to build doesn't mean, do not assume that the town is suddenly going to upgrade your road and you're going to be living on right. a town road. She, she, would, she, can, she brought this up to us and I think we right. kind of informed her of that. The other well, you yeah. told you, you guys, my, I'm looking for my you need to identify yourself. I'm first. sorry, Cindy, that, Red, no. Cindy Riddle. Yep. My interpretation when I left was you guys told me to go home and look at my deeds. Yes. Because I, I bought two properties to protect and not develop. I live on the road on the fire pond. And, I, and when I bought the house, I was told it was a class three. Found out right before we closed that it was not the truth. Um, so Who told you it was class three? The owner and the realtor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the neighbors, been, the neighbors I, filled me in. I've been there and, and mm -hmm. I worked for Morristown a long time. Yeah. And I've had people yeah. with the realty tell that we plowed right to their dooryard. It was a class four road. Yeah. And, and yeah. that didn't happen. So I, so so we did we did know it was class four and we accepted that and we've accepted it. And we've asked numerous times when, I mean, the, the, the Kustro subdivision, I love the Kustros, um, they, built, they built that subdivision in 2005 and the DRB thought that it was a class three road because they were plowing up to Mark Chauvin's driveway, which is mine. So the Kustros spent 500,000 on the road. They did all the things. They sold off all those lots for 280,000 a piece. And then the rumor has always been that you couldn't actually build up there. And I don't know if that's true or not. It's just a rumor. And I accidentally found a document. You can't other... build up there? I found well, a that was just a rumor. It was a rumor. Oh. Yeah. It's a rumor because it's a, it's a subdivision on a class four road. Can you, can you, and there's documents in select board notes back. I sent them to you tonight after you wrote to me. All right. Um, I wasn't here, but I look back through the select board notes and there's a lot of discussion of the road has to be upgraded to class three before people can build. That was back in 2015. I don't know if the rules have changed. Maybe it just has to be a safe road. It doesn't have to be a class there's three. Written, there's written, I only know this because I went through this in my house. There is clauses about like percentages of, of pitch of the road. Right. That all has to go through the DRB and all that stuff. So. Right. right, so now, so now there is gonna be a new house put up there. And that realtor told that buyer that it was a class three road up to the fire pond. He's, he's not debating it. He just said, I, I'm just sent, telling you right. the facts right. that he was sold. He was sold that there was a class three road. So he is going to build or he's putting in a permit. Yeah, I, his permit will get hung up on some of this stuff. Well, I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know if it will. I, I went so, it for a year <laughs> so if, if he does build, then the other lot owners who bought as, a, as an investment have no intention of living there. If they go to a realtor and put it up for sale, are those realtors going to say it's a class four road, you don't have to worry? Or it's the town is eventually going to turn it into a class three. That's the only reason I brought up the debate of there's people on the road that cannot afford to pitch in. People bought, they bought intentionally on a class four road. They have a plow truck, they're off the grid. They're perfectly happy with, they plow that whole half mile. But are they ever gonna be forced to pay to upgrade the road because people are gonna build in the subdivision? So that's all I'm asking. That's all I came for. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to hear no, your no, debate no, of, it, but it's, it's of what's true. true. You guys have talked about it and it sort of seems to me what we, is a select board is to when, when somebody's looking and we ought to send something to realtors too, because as I say, I know Walcott's walking right into the middle of this one too with somebody who's who's um, built up near Zach's, Zach's Woods. Zach Woods. Yeah, okay, and is happily plowing away and he said somebody in town told him that the town was going to take over the road and the Walcott select board's going, oh yeah? <laughs> well, that Zach mean, Wood goes right through the garden. Yeah, yeah. And that's on our end. Yeah. So, so someplace, how do we inform people? I have one other issue too. Ron is, work, Ron is working with one of the homeowners with a commercial business as being, and Ron, I don't know if, if Ron's checked out, or Ron's still no, checked out. Um, so there's gonna be also a commercial business, which we don't know how many employees, is gonna be on the class four road. So I think you need to decide what you're gonna do with the class four road, if that steep session, 
section can't handle all these new people can't handle a new business with an unknown number of employees trucks whatever we don't know that's coming up so we just need to look at ron what's the business that's, and where is it going there's already a business there that was approved by the DRB three or four years ago for Tyler Maynard's woodworking shop. He builds uh, custom, you know, uh, cabinets and furniture and things like that. I think he only had one or two employees, and most of the work they did was offsite. But that was his woodworking shop, and um, related to it, it's on his residential lot. You know, it's not a. He's on the steep section of the class. Yeah, yeah. He's class yeah. three road stops down by the old barn. Yeah, okay, right at the bottom. At the bottom. Yeah, yeah, Jim Fontaine's house, it stops. And then Tyler's business woodworking shop was 385. And then his house is at 501 right at the corner before you turn to the fire pond. So if he were to modify his use of the property at, let's call it 385, and keep 501 as just as residential, then the select board would have to deal with the 1111 permit at 385 because he's, he's approved for a certain amount of use there now. He'd either have to come in under that use or if he's gonna exceed it, amend his 1111. The 1111 permit is what triggers the road improvements potentially. But it's a new business, it's not as woodworking. It's an additional business, completely okay. separate. Well, this is, Ron, this is a new business? This is a new business. And that would be a permit. In? Yeah, the, any, any, right, the board policy is any change of use. So if he changes from woodworking to something else, you'd have to review it to make sure that that new use doesn't have any negative impact on the road. So you're, Cindy, you're saying he's putting in a new business. It's a different a separate, business. completely different. It has nothing to do with woodworking or building homes. Yeah, he hasn't, he hasn't clarified it with me yeah, yet. That's why. Yeah, he hasn't clarified all those details for me yet. The The plan of attack was about six weeks ago, maybe. He wanted to do a cannabis cultivation business there. Okay. All right. Okay. No, Ron, no, no. we're, we're going to move to go into the executive session. Discuss this further. Yes. Uh, under, under what authority? What's our reason for going into executive session? Yeah, yeah, because sense. of the content of the discussion, which is what's going to happen up there for the uh, permit, that's for the permit, the potential permit. No, those are public discussions generally, unless there's a legal or property rights legal issue that was pending, maybe. Well, I can just ask the buildings are already there. So I don't want to put you in that spot. Yeah, yeah. exactly. The permits haven't been approved though, right, Ron? No, there's 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 no permits approved. So whatever's happening there is under review, and it's under the zoning uh, review process. Eventually, if what he says changes the eleven eleven permit, then the board will have an eleven eleven permit to review. We just we just need to go drive up and look at it and see what's going on. I mean, sure, if yeah. Somebody is somebody building something that they haven't even permitted and told Ron about is sort of a no no. Yeah, no, we have we have aerial photos of what he's built. And he's okay. he knows he needs permits and he knows he may need a state permit. Okay. Or a license or a license from the Vermont Cannabis Board. <laughs> oh oh gosh. Yeah. <laughs> That's what he's doing. Oh, okay. <laughs> so whatever permits are needed is is not an executive session. That's just that's an open discussion. So you do knew you knew he was doing something new. Well, he, he called me about six weeks ago and said, I want to change my use. And, that, and awesome. since, since then, he's been trying to figure out what to propose to me. And Got he it. hasn't got no permit. Got it. He has no permit. Yeah. Every, every, whenever people do stuff, they don't automatically get a permit a lot of times. And it takes a while for them to come around with an application. Sort of jump the gun, if you will. <laughs> jump the gun a little bit, ask questions later. Yeah. So what, what do we have to do? Like they were saying... Uh, going up and visit the place or something like that? Is that our role to do that, to, to investigate uh, uh, any other structures that were built? Uh, wrong. No, the select board's role is to uh, defend the town zoning bylaw at the environmental court, if it goes that far. Right. Then my question was just the increased traffic. 
Yeah, that's sure. the 11, that's the 1111 permit she's uh, talking about. Yes. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm here is can the class four have you, seen, handle... have you seen an increase in traffic curb? Yes. Okay. okay. And once once we start building in the subdivision, it, if anybody want, would drive up there, it does get narrow up by the fire pond. And when all the construction happened last year at Tyler's house, when the construction trucks were coming up one after another, it was a convenient spot you could stop above his driveway. You could see the trucks coming, you could sit there and watch them go in, but now they're gonna come up past the fire pond. So people are gonna to have to back up all the way to the fire pond and there's ditches there. It's narrow and there's not gonna be any place for you to turn off and you can't pass a heavy machinery vehicle going up and down the road. I mean, you can't pass it. Right, that comes into Tyler's permit again. But back, so to, then, back to the whole development. But back to the whole, right. but yeah. back to, it's the whole thing is it's, it's Tyler's new business and the subdivision. And if you do get a lot more people living up there and they're expecting a certain experience or being sold at an elevated standard of living, not like the way I live. <laughs> well, I you, 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 you know, there. if someone's if someone's buying a piece of property there, they're driving up there. They understand what they're getting. I hope so. I mean, I, I used to be your neighbor. I live right in Lansky. I yes. Yeah. So I understood what I was buying a one mile private driveway that I had to maintain myself. Right, but yeah, people but don't, don't know, always understand that. that. Yeah. Well, I, if you're from Vermont, you well, do. Shame on you if you don't. don't. Well, I know, you know but that, that doesn't, that, <laughs> that doesn't, that doesn't become town, a town. This doesn't become a town I... problem. Yes, when you, when I you misunderstand. Yeah. When I bought that property up there, I didn't come to you guys as a town and say, hey, will you take over my road? Yeah, that's true. Well, and nobody, no, and nobody is asking you to take right. over. No, There's no, not no, been right. any of that no, no, discussion. No. It's yeah. just the right. what happens in five years when... But but I, but I see, I think what... Is it good? I think what we can do as being responsible is kind of like with the fireworks. What you can do is better communication. So that if, I mean, if I'm, if I'm from away and I'm buying a beautiful lot up there, and the realtor tells me that, oh, it's a class three road and it's going to be fine. What, I, am, what am I, I why see, don't I, I believe that? But, but that's I'll, not I'll the tell you, half, the reason, half no. the reason why I came to this right? board is it's because we're problem. so retentive away from not allowing any development in this town. And what we've talked, we want more people to come to this town. We have someone who's invested $280,000 in the lot up there. And we're going to turn around and say, you shouldn't build up there. We're not going to let you build up there. We shouldn't let that happen. We should want people to build in this town. We're running out of land in this town everywhere you go. I'm not, so, I'm not like disagreeing if, if with that, but then does, the property, does that mean we should build the road for them? No. Exactly. They, they, That's all I'm trying they to understand. be clear. They, they, have the, they have the access in their deed. There's a right, there's a right of way or there's a, there's, it's, a, it's how it works. The same thing with Levex. There's five houses up there now. Should we take over Levex? No. Oh, no, that's right. I'm definitely not in favor of taking over. Can you take roads. over Blackberry Lane? Because we're really. I know. <laughs> I know. I'm going back to my road. The bottom line, right? is, so the bottom line is we're so are running out of revenue. It's yeah. it, it, one or two. We either accept that they're all just a bunch of woodlots up there for the rest of their life, and somebody else starts paying all the tax money. I mean, we, 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 Man, I don't think I don't think anyone is saying that people shouldn't build. That isn't what anyone is saying. Well, I think what, what people, it's, it's, and that's not what I'm saying is I'm right. asking what happens when the road can't handle it. Yeah, when we can't handle the traffic because it is narrow. And how much traffic saying, can, how much traffic can it handle? Yeah. Well, when, when, when is the point? If it's residential, it would be no different than let's say, you, let's, let's, let's say I don't know that answer. What this how the house that she's using? That well, she's if there's, there's a potential of 25 homes on Diggins Road. And Ron sent out a right. nice map showing, and I didn't even think about the. There's two houses that could go there. There's two houses there. It was like 25. Okay, I never thought of that. There's four right now. I never thought that you could have 25 on that road. So there is going to wow. be a time, yeah. and that's without subdividing. Um. So will there be a time when you have to talk about it? Well, I <laughs> would that be a development review board thing, Ron? At that point, if no, they, they start they saying the policies. that. If they start saying that houses can build up there? Well, when, when they apply for their permit, the, if the road doesn't meet the, the, the DRB standards, oh. they need to upgrade the road prior to building the house. That's how that process goes. Which is exactly what happened to you. Yes. Okay. Which can cost. Oh, yeah. So yeah. pieces have to come in to fit into the puzzle to right. make and figure out and we're just not at that point yet right and that's okay i don't need an answer yeah mm -hmm. just, but it's good that you i just keep want to just say yes there might come a time 
And we're not saying do it now. Absolutely not. That's not what we're saying. Right. And that maybe maybe there'll be a grant. I mean, why why not we apply for a grant to say let's I mean, as the town, we say, hey, there is 25 people looking to go there and we want this 25 people there or we don't want this 25 people there. Right. Maybe we want and we, we, we want to apply, we apply, we, we, want, we need them. We, that's not that we want them, we need them. We need more people in this town. Let's be honest. Right. You can't you can't go without growth. That's right. I pay ten thousand dollars for taxes a year. You think I enjoy yeah. it? No. Yeah. You know? <laughs> we need more. But, Anyway, well, I'll let you think about okay. it. Okay. And we can apply for grants, such like that. That's, that's something that we can start talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. We'll stay in touch. All right. <laughs> Thank but, you. Yeah. But there's Thank also you. right ways. There's, there's a lot more to this than just. Oh, All right. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. How, how many other roads do we potentially have this problem with? Oh, the, the... Yeah. Yeah, the list is getting pretty short. Over the last four or five years, we've tried to, to uh, dispense with these issues. And yeah. right now, I think we're down to probably two. Oh, OK. Well, that's, that's the biggest so, for sure. Right. Yeah, oh, it's yeah. a big, and, and it's, it's so steep. Yeah. yeah. It's so steep. Yeah. No. We're working on it. Yeah. yeah. OK. OK. Well, any more of the highway budget? We, we're at the end here. Oh, oh no, highway. gravel no. crushing. Gravel no. crushing? That's obviously highway. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I don't know if it's time to bring it up, but let's do the highway crushing, I guess, first. Uh, yeah, sure. So the, the budget for this year um, has $38,000 for crushing. Because of fuel cost increase and general inflation, to get that same dollar amount, you need about 45000 so Mark is still trying to talk to the only two crushing companies, uh, which is Tucker, sorry, R.E. Tucker and McAuliffe, and try to get, they each have slightly different quotes that depend on a whole, you know, five or six different factors, depending on exactly what work they do. So Mark is continuing to talk to them about fine tuning that quote, uh, but we need to get them scheduled and spend the money, if you will, by June 30. Uh, by June 30? Yeah, by June 30. So we got about six weeks uh, left. Happened, we could roll that over as a board, right? Uh, we, we could, but uh, Mark needs the gravel and we, we need to get it done. And I'd rather stay on schedule as much as possible if we can do that. I don't know if the price is going to keep going up. One of those questions either. So it's probably the cheapest it will be this year anyway. Uh, What's the status, Mark? Is it a conflict of interest for me to promote my own company? What's that, Brian? Just want to know what the status is currently on your gravel. It is not. It is not. Your uh, fresh gravel. Well, when we get moving on Cooper Hill, it's going to be disappearing very quick. So that'll eliminate what How you got? How much gravel you got left up there, Mark? Um, I thought my head I can't die. I'd have to go up and look at it and try to pinpoint it for you. No, I, I just, I, I'm just trying to think of something here because the next thing is going to come up is about the fuel. It's already in yeah, there. That's not good. <laughs> yeah, Tucker, not good. <laughs> Tucker already added a fuel charge to cr Crusher. Now, now we have a, a second question is the filling of the town underground storage thing. Well, my, my thing is, and I probably shouldn't say it, but I'm going <laughs> to. Things are going to come to a halt here pretty quick. The way things are going. <laughs> that's an assumption. That's, that's an assumption. A, that's an assumption. You're right. I'll bet on it. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, these people are going to be, these people are going to be crying for crushing. These people are going to be crying for building. These people are going to be crying for everything. I don't see that in the foreseeable future. Yes, so I'll bet fun. you. That's Not this year. Yeah. Because there's so much, there's well, some, the market is so flooded. If we got enough gravel to do it, we got to do this year. Well, that, there you go. I get it. Yep. You know? Yeah. Do we have enough gravel to do it this well, year? Well, we, we will not have enough gravel. No. And you got to think, we've already gone behind in our gravel because of the FEMA and all the gravel we hauled out with that. So that wasn't even resurfacing roads. So we're that knocks us way behind. Well, if the price of gravel yeah. keeps going, I mean, the price of fuel keeps going up, Mark. We might not even have to worry about gravel because we won't be able to afford to truck it. <laughs> yes. 
No, who, it's really. Who I mean, be driving? <laughs> I mean, if you if you can fill that tank up there, which is a ten thousand gallon tank, and save the town taxpayers seven thousand dollars, you figure you're buying you're going to be buying that stuff at the pump, and you're going to be spending eighty cents more a gallon for it. Right. I mean, we got to as fine people here think about that. We got to put our heads together and see what we could do to save that money you're projecting seven dollars a gallon diesel by the end of june yeah. i mean end of uh, uh may but yeah may. that's an assumption too one. it just yeah, went up by the 20 cents has to come back down i saw it at six the barrel price six went down. everything's coming down that way. another year Again, I, somebody I, I'm wants to clean saying, air. Yeah. Somebody wants. I want to throw air. that out there and see what the other board members think about it. And uh, do they want to pay eighty cents to a dollar? You're going to get your tax money back, but you've got a tank up there that will hold ten thousand gallons, and you can get it eighty cents cheaper by having them deliver it to us. What I got a price for five thirty nine yesterday. What's that? Five thirty nine. I got a five thirty nine yesterday, and it was. Uh, six thirty nine at mobile. Five thirty nine. That was delivered. That was out, delivered. You that delivered out, right? That's delivered. Yeah. Then so. if you take out, if we bite at the pump, then you got the administrative time too of that to you know try to get it out of the tax part of it. So there's more. No, it's not just. So there probably be back up to a dollar by the time you yeah. get you know all the fuel slips they got to go through for the sure. finance manager and then. Go to the state to get our taxes all taken off. Tax yeah. Ron, where will we find the money? Yeah, so the the fifty thousand dollar fuel budget has seven thousand dollars left in it for the you know from now to June thirty. If Mark gets that full, you know, it's gonna be in the four forty three thousand dollar range to fill it, um, which is leaving you short the 36,000. Um, the only thing I could think of uh, is potentially tapping into the capital reserve that's you know for emergencies and things like that, which we're certainly in with this unforeseen fuel charge. Uh, as we get closer to June 15th or so, we'll be you know taking a fine line look at the highway budget to see what actually happened this year overall. Uh, whether there's anything you know left in there um so to speak and then the other the other option is really just to go sort of a negative condition until uh, the next budget so you you could potentially overspend highways budget and have a negative balance at, at year end which Mark, would be uh, which would be absorbed by the uh, unassigned fund balance yeah. mark how can we conserve fuel Put leave them in the garage. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was, I well, was, I was, I was being serious. That's a waste of money too. I mean, you know, no. I, I had it planned here that, uh, to help these guys out. And I was going to bring it up tonight with all this other stuff, but I don't even think that's going to come about just because we've always talked about getting a couple tandems to help these guys. And I've talked to, um, you know, a couple people here in Hyde Park and, and I got them for $95 an hour, but you know, when, when they got their load on there, that they got to do bitching, they got to do this, they're going to be busy this summer. So you put a couple extra trucks on, you hire them, but you're up to $95. That ain't bad because some are getting 105 to 110, but there's a couple people right here in the town of Hyde Park I've talked to. A couple weeks ago, they were at 95. <laughs> They're but, probably at 105 uh, now. I'm just saying, they were. <laughs> right. But we're I, I'd rather, saying. you know, help these guys out. Like, so, a couple so of Mark, you're doing, for 95, you're doing all right. Is there a way that we can save? On the fuel part? I don't, I don't think so. Can we not have a you know, stand put up? Well, I would. Hate to be buying sand in the middle of winter time because we run out. You just say you run out and then you got to start hauling, then you got to start trucking. Yeah. In. Then you got to, yeah. Who wants to take the phone calls when the taxes go up? 
No, but um, you know, there might be something you could do there, Mark. I'm just going to throw this out there. You could Screen stop out. a pile and leave it up to the pit and see how this all goes. You could haul down what you think you would need and then make an addition pile up to the pit. And then in the wintertime, if you needed a few loads, you'd have the sand up there. And on a slow day, you know, when things aren't going too fast or the weather's cold or whatever, you could go up there and haul a few loads down. Or, or well, then, then you'd have to keep the, work that area with that sand. What's yeah, that? but you'd have to keep the pit open all winter. What's so, that? We'd have to keep the pit open all winter. Yeah, but you know. Do you have a loader up there? You've got a loader up there. You can plow that out pretty fast, a couple hours, an hour and a half. But if you think Mark, about the have geographic have part ever, of it, you can. Have we you ever screen service that gravel? one area over there? Have we only screened our have own? Have we gravel? ever screened our own gravel? No. You don't want to screen it. I've oh, been there and I've done that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, broken the, windshields. The, and no. Oh, he said gravel. gravel. He said it's gravel. Crazy. We screen our own sand. Oh, but he said gravel. Well, okay, screen. What if we could? Could we? I don't know what the, the bank looks like, but could we screen our own sand? We do. Oh, we do. Yes. Okay. We got to. So we create. A, we create our own. Yeah. So he's the gravel. The, the crushed gravel is for Cooper Hill Road. Yes. Okay. Yes. And what do you think of that idea, Mark? About um, they crush everything. Leaving three some years. up in the pit. You need to, you need to okay. just have one person do it all. Ten thousand yards all. I I don't think, well, if the fuel prices stay going up, what are you going to save in the end? Right. Nothing. It's still got to get hauled down. No, I got to truck the bucket the loader up. You got to find oh, a day where you can get the loader up there, break it free. I don't know. It just, have you ever better to have it trucks with an empty box in the back? <laughs> it's like being on <laughs> ice with the uh, uh, All the phone calls you're going to get. No, I know it, but I'm just, just thinking, think of can we haul enough sand down here because you got quite a bit of sand left out here right here to down garage now right uh, yeah we went through probably so you usually haul down what like eight thousand yards yeah okay could you haul down four thousand yards with what you got there and and stock the rest of it up to the pit if you didn't need it you'd leave it up there to be ready for next next spring to haul down yep. because you know they got quite a pile up there right now. I mean, I'm just throwing this out on the table because of the prices of fuel. Mm -hmm. it, it's an obvious concern. And, you know, we, we all got to put our heads together with the road foreman to do the best we can do to, to try to save the taxpayers money. And I think, you know, we can make this work. And I don't think we'd run out of sand. But if you needed sand, you wouldn't need it until you know probably way into February, right. and then you might not have a winter where you will need sand a lot. I agree with that. So, are you taking the risk now, or are you taking the risk then? Mark might have a little more headache, and he might cuss at us, but are we saving the taxpayer dollar? Yes. I know I've done it a lot, so. <laughs> I, well, I had a, I had a building where I had to put the sand in it. I had to get enough sand in there to last a year. You, it worked good when it was thirty years ago. But it don't work so good now. And still talking about by filling up the tank now. I I myself would like to fill that tank up somehow. I don't know about Mark, but Mark, what do you think? Well, if the prices are going up, I mean. Either way, even if we push in next year's budget, now you're going to be in the same situation next year because I don't think these fuel prices are going to come down next month. That's a good point right there. That's right. What's that? So either yeah. way, you know, we're going to be in the same situation next year we're in right now or we're just going to force ourselves definitely into the situation next year budget. Exactly. Yeah. So. I, I think and it's a part of the budget that you just can't control. You know what I mean? Like you can try to figure out what it is, but whoever saw these fuel prices coming. I I, I think we all. I think I buy it, but I look at the at a deficit road budget because when we get close to the end of of our fiscal year, so we get to the middle of June, we'll have some idea what's there for money. But then also when we balance up the books at the end of the year, there's out of everything there's the leftover money, 
you know, as to what do we do, and we could take that and apply it to the rest of the fuel bill. Yeah. And get you know, the instead fuel, of trying to find get, it now and, and get, different, and let's get just, the fuel, let's just fuel do it now. now. Yeah. Because you've got a month to pay for it. Oh, yeah. Right, Mark? Vince, they give you a month, but, right? No, it's, well, yeah, I'm not, I think, I think that's 30 days, I think. When, when, if you ordered the fuel, when could you get it? That's, I guess that's the question. Usually within a couple of days, they have it here. When oh, I call okay. them. Yeah, really? Ron, well, can, you don't can wait, we, it's gonna Ron, can we up. cash flow okay to cover it? Uh, yeah, we can do that. I think, I think um, getting that delivered now is going to be the best um, choice, if you will, because there's nothing in, and I think Brian, some, somebody said something about there's no um, immediate news of it going down. So it's only going to cost more tomorrow and every day that you wait. And we'll, fit, we'll, we'll, I'll work with the finance manager to give you a report. Um, I don't know if we'll have one for the 24th, but your first June meeting to sort of put this in numbers for y'all. We can have it on the 24th because of the pending increase, um, what they're projecting, but I don't know. We'll see what we can do. No, he's just oh, oh, no, no, I meant the order it now. Oh, order it now. Yeah, yeah, we yeah no, no, no. I'm, what I was talking about is just if you approve it tonight and get it delivered because it's more expensive tomorrow. I can work with Jen and get a good overview of all the things that we're talking about because they're they're hitting the, this inflation and fuel is hitting so many things that I think having a good snapshot across the whole budget is good as well as just what Mark has been talking about. And you said that tonight, if I tell me if I'm wrong, but you said tonight that they had about 700 gallons left. That was it. Uh, 600, 600, 600. Okay. Yeah, so it, it's 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 definitely timely, and it's you know if 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 we have to figure it out, and the board wants to say, uh, here's how you funded it. That's I, I I'll take that on with Jen to let you let you know where that money comes from. What what do we what do we consume a year to buy the fuel now? How much fuel do we consume a year? Mark, did you hear that? How much fuel do we consume a year? Uh, depends on everything i mean i can't every year is different roughly do you have an average roughly we probably do three loads a year oh jesus it's about thirty thousand gallons wow so to fill it right now so it depends on your winter you know if you're out every freaking weekend and every you know it yeah, varies I, you know, up and down but yeah, yeah you have to that's no, a third of our year's that. cost we have he's got 600 gallons we got we got it I'd rather do that than pay 80 cents more in a bulk yeah. to a dollar. The short term is going to go up. Wow. So why not go through it? Maybe the long term it comes yeah, back down. I think that, yeah. yeah, it'd be good. To, I think that's right, Matt. If we could bridge it somehow on the 10,000 by conservation and, and Mark and his crew doing the best they can, we might bridge the spike. Right. So you probably need a motion to, to purchase. Up. <laughs> purchase. Um, <laughs> Nine thousand no, seven hundred gallons. Do why do we need a motion to do motion? that? It's a, that's a, it's in our budget, right? Well, no, the the oh, remaining yeah. no, the remaining budget is only seven thousand. So, oh, yeah. so no, to exceed it, <laughs> to exceed it. Yeah. So the the motion is to order the the uh, nine hundred and fifty gallons or whatever the tank's going to take at the prevailing price and acknowledge that it's about uh, 40, 40 something thousand dollars over budget. Okay. So, so moved. moved. <laughs> <laughs> One second. All in favor? Anybody by saying aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Anybody abstaining? The ayes okay. have it. We got off on that, didn't we? Well, hey, Mark, I sent, you, I sent you another number for crushing. Just you get the text. What were we on before? Here, I gotta go back. Mark. What's that? I sent you a text message. Did you get it? It's another number you can get a quote for crushing on. Um, I didn't. Well, maybe. Yep. Mark, Mark, do you want to keep working on this uh, crushing cost until the next meeting on um, June? Uh, what the heck is it? June. How about May? May May twenty fourth. Okay. <laughs> Or do you want to not, um, to not to exceed tonight to let you go forward if you find a good pricing? Maybe not to exceed just because of 
Yes, we got to kind of fast track it to be in before June. You know what I mean? Before July 1st. Right. Right. Um, the other thing, the fuel though, that could be a little bit, you know, obviously, whatever the fuel price is tomorrow when I call, you know, it's going to go up or down or whatever, but be pennies. Yeah, we assume. understand that, Mark. But, okay. All right. The way, the way it's going, it's going to that be. That was yesterday's price. <laughs> so yeah, I don't know what the middle price is. I, I but know. I would assume it's close, but it's going to be within pennies. Yeah. So on the on the crushed gravel, what's the number? Is it forty five thousand not to exceed? With thirty eight thousand in the budget, so the board's approving a seven thousand over. Right. So that's the that's the second motion, and yeah, you know, obviously these two decisions are are what uh, we'll present some more information on on. on a cash flow, and we don't know where that seven thousand is coming from yet. That's what he's uh, on the yeah, yeah. I need to. I need to detail that. We don't know right now. We're doing a bottle drive. <laughs> <laughs> can we? Can we lessen the amount? Can we? Can we lessen like the that. amount to be crushed <laughs> to match the? Can we lessen the amount to be crushed to match the budget number? Well, uh, that's what I, we were saying. Even about the sand. You know, if we hauled down, right. you know, enough sand, like it takes eight thousand a year, and we haul down four thousand with what we've got up here, leave the other four thousand up there done. Right. Yeah, Matt, the um, the per yard crushing cost is based on minimum ten thousand, so that's where the the price we have for McCullough is four fifty, so that's where the forty five thousand comes from. So if you reduce to eight thousand on crushing, they could go to six dollars a cubic yard. Mark, we won't leave you out without no sand. Uh, who's got first and second on the crushing at uh, not to exceed 45,000? We're not saying that now. Need a motion, you said? Yes, please. Uh, I'll, I'll move it. The second? Second. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, uh, are, are we aye. agreeing to using one of those crushing quotes? No, no not to, to exceed. Okay. We're agreeing to a budget. Right, not yeah. to exceed. Okay. He's going right. to, he'll, he'll, you know. Yeah. Was that? Uh, I so I second that, seconded yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> you seconded it. <laughs> and not to exceed. Not to exceed. So uh, we'll do a vote again. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Standing? The ayes have it. Okay, let's see. Let's move along. This is, I just missed my I just missed my son's first baseball game on the record. He never missed a baseball. So we want to move on to the administrative matters. The fire warden, five year appointment. He's, yeah, he's Brian Nolan. What was that, Brian? Reappointment. Of Reappointment of fire warden, five years. Brian Nolan. Is Ryan on? I thought he was supposed to be on. Yes, it's his phone number. Six nine. He's on. Ryan, can you hear us? You awake, Ryan? Are you sleeping? <laughs> Ryan. There. There he is. <laughs> yeah. Ryan, can you hear us? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> I just I just um it's pretty dry out now. And um I understand they had a Grass fire, or brush fire again today. Yeah. Did the person that had the fire, did they get a permit for that? No, it was an accidental cigarette or something. It was an accidental Nobody cigarette. But it was on yeah, a... It started, it, it started beside the road. Started beside you the road. Know, okay. Some lady working from... you're, not, you're not issuing permits then now, are you? Um, some depending on the day. Depends on the day, but it's pretty dry right now, right? Yeah, in places. Why I'm asking because I had a taxpayer come to me today and talking about the fire they had today. And I guess I agree with him 
if you don't give elk a permit and somebody sets a fire, what's the repercussions on that? Um, a twenty dollar fine for not having a permit. You can't charge them for manpower. You can't charge them for pumpers no. and stuff like that because now if somebody sets a fire on their own and it's too dry and they don't ask for a permit, they should no. be liable for that, shouldn't they? Instead of the other taxpayers, the way the price of fuel is right now. Yeah, um, I agree with you, but there's nothing you can do. I think it's like twenty or thirty dollar fine for not having a permit. That's it. There's nothing wrong the board could do about something about that in our own. I don't. I don't think you'd be prevented from looking into a or local ordinance that deals with that. Just like uh, some towns have adopted fire alarm ordinances. If you have a faulty, you know, unit, you can get charged for the response time. If you've been warned three times, I just I don't know of any towns. I mean, I can't. Not that there is none. I just haven't looked at it to see if there's a separate ordinance process to say uh, if the. And I think the state of Vermont advises all the town fire wardens on when and when not to issue fire permits, and I think that's what Ryan's tied into that piece. Okay. When you get into the gray area where the state has an issue to a red flag warning or whatever the state does, then it's a, sort of a day to day call by your appointed tree warden. So. You know, tonight's agenda item is to reappoint Ryan for five years so he can make those decisions. And without an ordinance, it's, I think Ryan's correct that the only repercussion is a small fine if you do start a fire without a permit. No, I just, it's not even worth the paper. It's not even worth the paperwork and the time to even issue a fine. But um, really, but we as a board couldn't set something for. So, yeah, I would look at right. I would look into whether if the board wants to look into a forest fire ordinance type thing where there's a penalty if they don't get a local permit, then that's something we could look at under the just the normal select board powers for local ordinances. Okay, because so, uh, one of the issues with that is if they start running, like if they get a fire that's out of hand and they're just thinking of cost, then yeah. they're going to try to fight that fire themselves as long as they can and know it's going to be $10,000. If the fire department shows up, that is honestly, that's not right. And I agree with you, Roland, but this is, I'm just thinking as the average person going, uh oh, this is going to be $5,000. We'll just keep putting water on it until it gets way out. Uh, it is a good point. Roland, oh, go ahead. Roland, we, we have very few brush fires in Hyde Park. One, maybe two a year. Yeah. Not I, very many. So you're talking, I mean, I was just, I said to the taxpayer that asked me that question today that I would talk about it tonight and see and what today was just an accidental. Like I said, some lady was working from home and she started to smell smoke and she looked out her window and see that the side of the road was on fire headed to the woods. Oh. And nobody and no other neighbors were around. So <laughs> I mean right. no, but that you know how that was things go and, and and now I can tell him that tomorrow or tell the person that tomorrow that what happened and you know, right. Because and like I said, we have very few brush fires in Hyde Park. They were not very many. Ryan, you mentioned <laughs> that, uh, the thirty dollar uh, fine doesn't really cover the your efforts to uh, what would cover the efforts? I oh, I don't. I'm just saying. I mean, to get. I mean, to get a twenty dollar ticket to fill out all the paperwork and do all that stuff. I think I get paid. Thirty dollars a year to be fire warrants to the state of Vermont. So, <laughs> oh. I don't even I don't even cover my gas to go inspect all these complaints that I get for illegal burning. You know, I'm running around in my personal pickup all the time. Right. When they're calling up saying, "I smell, I smell garbage burning," you go look at it. By the time you get there, whatever they were burning, you can't even find it. <laughs> and I get like thirty bucks a year for the state. So. As far as issuing tickets, Spenders, I'm going to make this. I'll make a motion to approve Ryan the next five years. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> you got a second? A second. All, right. Right. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Ryan, thanks right. for your service. Before, before, you, before yeah. we talk him out of this, let's get out of here. Okay, you can? I can't. I have to abstain, right? Okay. Yeah, oh, I abstain. No, I was asking. Congratulations, Ryan. Have a good evening. <laughs> He's like, I wait. can tell you, I don't, do it for, I don't do it for the money. I can tell you that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> yeah, actually, thank you for doing it, Ryan. <laughs> Oh, Ryan, any update on the fire truck? Um, no, we called in there today, Matt, and they hadn't even looked at it yet. Okay. And we told them that if they can't try to look at it in a timely manner, then we'll have to bring it somewhere else because it's kind of a, I mean, we kind of need it back soon, sooner than later. But he was thinking it might have been, he's thinking it might either be some injectors or maybe a, uh, a cooler. Who's looking at it? Uh, Charlie Boys has got it right now. Charlie Boys ain't got onto it. Uh, they're busy. Right no, we bought it. We bought it there Friday. No, they thought they were. We told them to try to get it a price to us by Tuesday because you guys were having a meeting, so we could discuss it. And he says, "Oh yeah, I'll, tr I'll do my best." And we called down there at like four o'clock today, and they hadn't even looked at it. Oh. So, so that's that. But we'll let you know as soon as he, we hear back from him. He didn't think it's a head gasket, but he did say if it's an injector leaking, then you still got to pull the head to do it. So I would imagine it's the injectors because that, as much as them idle and stuff over the years, is it E2? Yeah. 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 So. He kind of thought it was an injector because apparently they've seen that. It's a common thing with them, I guess. But, I'm surprised so they <laughs> I'll let you know as soon as we we know. Huh. How many uh, gasoline run in, uh, vehicles do you have over the department? One. The brush truck. The what truck? The brush, brush truck. That's it. Rest of mild diesel. Does that go out usually every week? Well, no. Well, I don't know. The last two days we've gone out like four times. So. <laughs> but, no, I was just looking in the no. in the warrants here, and it was being filled up. Uh, I, I'm assuming that's the only gas truck uh, was being filled up every week. And so, uh, wondering, what, what, wondering what was going on there. I couldn't tell you that one diesel over there so when i saw the gas uh, being filled up every week well, it, it was usually is it diesel or is it gas what's that is it diesel or is it gas because we all fill up at the pump it's gas it. oh, okay yeah because i know we, we all fill up at the pump over at maple fields but no i i can look into it you want me to was that his find word? out do you fill up your water pumps and uh, all your chainsaws and all your small equipment that way? Could that be the fuel bill for gas? Yeah, we, I mean, we'll get five gallon, a five gallon gas can full of gas. It could, so it could be that too. Was it a lot now? Every day. It was, I'd have to look again to make Did sure. Okay. okay. Like, I can't remember, it was like 25 yeah. gallons, something like that each time. Yeah. But a five gallon, that'd be, you know, five. Gas True. You wouldn't be using that much still. Unless they're pumping. Maybe worth looking into. What's that? Unless they're pumping. Running gas. That's max. Okay, any further discussion on that? If not, we'll go to Nemerick. Get this one on this video. You know, I can give you a, a quick overview. We have a couple of guests online, uh, Matt Reed and Terry Sabins. Um, uh, Susan was involved with this topic uh, as chair. And the uh, basic topic is Nemrick's existing town assessor contract that we have for all the former Board of Lister duties it expires on June 30th. Um, Terry Sabins, who's a, a contracted professional town assessor for numerous towns including Morristown and Matt Reed, who's our um, appointed assistant to Nemrix town assessor and myself and Kim and Krista, you know, we all have interactions with the assessor and part of the interactions is responsiveness, communication, uh, both to town staff and uh, residents. And some of the things that we've, you know, being a new contract, we've had to sort out a little bit and adjust and one of the options 
uh, early on really would, and I think, I think Susan was here when it first came up, was whether or not we could regionalize the town assessor and basically have a, uh, not a regional, you know, like county planning commission position, but a uh, memorandum of understanding between uh, a bunch of towns that would share the cost of a professional town assessor. And that would basically result in dedicated uh, directed time uh, to each town, whatever they wanted, what, you know, whatever hours they wanted, how they wanted things done. Uh, you can't really do that kind of direction with a contractor. You hire a contractor, you say, here's your statutory requirements, and they sort of do have a lot of leeway in how they figure that out. That's the, that's the classic contractor role. We can't direct them. If it's a municipal or, or cooperative agreement, then each select board can uh, more directly direct a employee. Uh, so there's a little bit more control, if you will, than turning over the process to an assessor. There, as far as I know, there's some statutory late times on NEMRIC. They, they just got busy and we had to kind of help them uh, meet some deadlines with the state property valuation review. And that worked out okay, but it's still something that the contractor should have taken care of. But other than that, um, th they do, NEMRIC does a lot of towns and they do charge a contractor rate. The idea with the regional person, which I'm gonna turn it over to Terry for her work, uh, is to try to figure out how to get a trained person into the towns at a reasonable cost and, and with a little bit more direct control um for the select board so i see terry's turning on her camera and i'll let her take it from here i think i see the ceiling right now it's cloudy you're a ghost yeah it's like something's on your lens maybe like a, a fingerprint or something i don't know normally i fine right here it's not but it's a little bit of me yeah, you can take your video off. Maybe that will clear up the your your static or your your skipping a little bit. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Terry. So I'm just uh, I guess I'm just going to explain how this shared assessor job will work. Is um, I I have been retired. I retired from uh, the town of Essex three years ago. And I just work part time. I do Morristown, uh, Johnson, and Jericho. And it seems to help a lot because, you know, I care about the towns that I do. And if you share one person amongst four or five towns, that person is going to concentrate on your town. It's going to help your grand list growth um, because they're going to be doing the job the way they should and making sure nothing gets missed and things get. Um, submitted on time and I've been working on this since I retired because I know how I mean I've probably turned down 12 to 15 municipalities just in the last three years you know because everybody needs nobody can do this job everybody needs someone to do this job and understand this job so um, I've got six towns right now that are interested and each town would submit how many hours a month that they think that they would need. And I will help do that once I see your 411, check out your current use accounts and check all that out. Um, and so that one person is that one person is going to be committed to your town for however long they want to stay. Uh, there will be one parent town. We haven't gotten that far yet but the parent town will hire this employee as a full-time assessor. And then that town will bill out to the other four or five. I've got two really tiny towns. So it, the, having that many towns isn't a lot. I take care of about 3000 parcels myself and I have over 300 current use accounts and I only work 20 hours a week. So, um, I'm setting this job up for somebody to do almost that in 40 hours until they get better trained. I got somebody that's that's already half trained, so that will work out well.
So what, what costs are we sharing uh, with other towns? I, I did do some little research and I, there's, um, cause you're an employee, uh, we'll be sharing like uh, benefits and stuff like that as well. Yes. That's the only, the problem with this job is there's no full-time employment in this field in Vermont. I mean, we got 251 towns. I'm going to guess there's, you know, a handful that are full-time. There's not a lot. You can't get the younger generation into this field because they need full-time, they need benefits. Um, you know, they need all that stuff to be able to commit to the job. And that's why this job doesn't get filled. The average age of a lister in the state of Vermont is uh, 62 years old. And you just can't get the younger generation in this field. Once this gets going, I am going to, now that COVID is calmed down, I am, I plan on going to um, high schools and the community colleges and the tech centers to uh, um, talk about municipal work to get the younger generation into the field. But until I have a shared assessor job to present to them, it, it won't go anywhere. Yeah, I, I um, back last fall, and actually I heard from, first time was Elmore, <clears throat> who was saying, you know, they knew that we were looking and we were trying to fill a position and you're trying to figure out how you deal with this. And again, as, as Terry said, nobody's being able to, you know, to, to find lifters in their town. And your small towns, you don't say, so, you know, could maybe a group of us get together and share one. And it sort of didn't seem to go any place and then town meeting comes and things just get busy but uh, but again following through on it, it it's this is possible and and to me what and we went with nimrick because we didn't there really wasn't any other choice <laughs> you know it's at least with the uniform companies you got two people this with you know with this it was like there was nimrick or or whatever um but to me, and, and as Terry, I think the idea, and, and Matt gets you to jump in after, that that the group that you put together is that person's going to be taking care of your towns. Period. You know, so they they will they will know what's happening in communities. They'll be involved in the communities. Um, you know, so I think it, it's a it would be a good way for a group of communities to share the cost of something that is uh, that's a real asset to the communities. That none of us can afford on on our own, and and you can see an individual trying to piece it together. You can see why that certainly isn't going to appeal, and certainly to a young person. Whereas again, if you say, okay, here's a here's a concept that we're going to use here in Vermont, I think if you can probably get one group of people to do it, I would be surprised if it doesn't catch on pretty fast. <clears throat> Matt, what do you think about it? Ron and I have talked a bit about this and the original contract that we had nothing against the contractors, but obviously they're pulled in every direction and they can substitute as they see fit. And so as long as they produce the requirements of the contract, we can't really say how they get to it. And that caused a little bit of problem when they got backlogged. Um, and there's a few other details with, uh, Things that uh, like updating um, our map system, which affects everybody, and it's not really in their contract. So to direct them to do that, they give us a quote, and that's fine. But suddenly, if they don't have the time or we don't get it, that becomes a problem. But if we had an employee, we could certainly direct them to do certain things. Um, whereas the other way around, it hasn't hasn't worked so well. That's all I have to say. Thanks. Yeah, it, it, getting an employee is going to help you with your mapping. And this employee can also become an E911 coordinator because they'll have enough time to do that in these small towns. Because, you know, the little towns I work in, I see Morristown gets a lot of it, but Johnson doesn't get much and Jericho doesn't get a whole lot. But in Jericho, the lists are there. She does E911. She does a bunch of stuff. The only thing I do in Jericho, I only do four hours a week there. 
all I do is all their permits, all their commercial, all their sketching, all their valuation, and she pretty much does everything else. Um, but if you get one person that's going to be dedicated to your town, they're going to be able to do everything, all your grand lists, all your current use, everything. Now, do you guys have listers or you do or you don't? We, we have Matt. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Um, I came on at the beginning of COVID. Um, so the training started to whittle down into not much and our current person left. And obviously it was, uh, we went from kind of two to three listers that have been there for a long time to me um, at the beginning of COVID and the software and the changes and the training honestly became way overwhelming. And then my workload, yes. my personal workload went up and it comes down to the point of missing things um, and dealing with it. I was just looking at your numbers of parcels and high parks numbers. I mean, a hundred percent efficient person in high park working 10 hours because there's a minimum amount of lister work always but a, you know 10 hours a week and i mean we had lister hours for four hours a week for one person i mean obviously that's a that's at 100 percent efficiency for you so you know it would take six people for you know four hours each a week to do what you do so um that's where i saw it was really getting overwhelming and then and i understand our contractors got overwhelmed too because they don't have the people either. Well, I can tell you that I think every municipality that contacted me wanted to get away from Nimerick um, for those reasons. And they still are with them because they can't find anybody. So that's why I'm creating this position. And, you know, they're getting so much into the reappraisal work that their grand list maintenance seems to, like you say, get behind. Um, I have listers in Morristown and there are listers in Jericho, but there are no listers in Johnson. So what, what happens is Morristown's a good example. There are three listers. None of them really know how to do what I do. So they basically just sign off on everything that I do. But at least there's somebody in the town watching it, which is nice because Dwayne, he's been a lister for a pretty long time. Um, but he, I mean, he wouldn't even know how to sketch a 24 by 24 house. You know, he just, he doesn't even know how to use that system. But he knows he was my, um, my chauffeur when I first got there. Cause I didn't know my way. I live in Milton, so I don't know my way around there. And um, but the, the listers are good because they, they catch stuff and they, they have, a, they have somebody that works in the office too. And um, she basically just does the clerical work and stuff like that. So, you know, they're a little more set up than some places, but they've, they've got a lot more, they get a lot of commercial, they've got, you know, they've got a lot of stuff going on there. So that's why the, the full-time person that I'm trying to get on now, the towns that are going to be part of it are all small like you guys. So it won't be as big of an issue as far as listers. If they're there, they can sign off. If not, then they can sign you know, you have to give them the authority to sign the grand list. And I will be helping them along the way. Terry, one of the things, you know, I'm willing to stay on as a, as a lister. I'm only one, so we don't have a quorum ever to, to do a lot of things. So there's some authority issues. But, you know, I am familiar with the town and, you know, I'm a surveyor, so I understand it. But just to let you know, when you're if you're putting a plan together or a concept is that um, entering data and that kind of time, I don't have the time for um, to yeah. do that. I would just be reviewing. I don't mind setting on abatement boards. I can go look at some properties. I'm not going to do evaluations, but I can go, if there's a problem with a property or something, or even a hostile landowner, I can go look at it. But um, after that, it's got to come from whoever this employee may be. Right. So my my normal record, um, even actually even in Essex when I was there the whole time, for as far as grievances, I get one or two, and that's it. Because I always work with people before and make sure that they're happy with what they're going to be getting in their value before. So I don't get 
hardly any grievances at all. And that's how I'm going to train this person to make sure that they do it um, the way that I I treat it like if it was my own. If it was me, this is how I'd want it. And that's how I'm going to, this person, I actually worked with this person when I first started this field 20 years ago. And um, he's excited to get back on board into this field. And, uh, and I think he'll do good. You know, and what's good is, like I said, he's half trained. I've been giving him all kinds of stuff and his wheels are turning. He goes, oh yeah, I remember all this now. But you got to remember too that we're switching from Nimric to Axiomatic for the grand list. And that's going to be huge. Uh, this could be a huge impact for all the municipalities. And if you have one person doing five or six, he'll learn from each town. And, and um, you know, it works, it works out pretty well. Uh, Terry, what is your relationship with this um, startup, let's call it, uh, with the state of Vermont PVR? folks, are they dedicating staff people to assist this, um, to assist your project that you're talking about here? Well, you, everybody has a district advisor and that, that district advisor will be used quite a bit. Um, and like, like today, I've got a, a Johnson issue and I called my other district advisor cause she's very seasoned. And you can call any of them and any of them will help you. If they don't know, they'll send you to somebody else. The district advisors are great. I'm trying to get Bala to house this whole thing because, you know, I can't, I mean, I don't, I don't want to do the whole state. <laughs> so um, I'm trying to get Bala to house it and I'm starting it and then everyone will pick up on it once it's, once they see it works. Anybody have any more questions? Sounds like a wonderful idea. Sounds like a, you've got plenty of experience and plenty of resource to uh, tap into and you'd be a great asset to Matt. That's the way I feel. I think probably what we need to do is have a proposal. You had you had something in here that you sent out to me. There for a long time. No, it's up. No, it's up. Yeah, I'm for it too. Sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. It's there's uh, there's two parts to this uh, concept. One is being a member town of the MOU with those five or four or five or six towns. And there's also the hosting question or the parent uh, town, which is what uh, Terry said had not been selected yet. So those are the two questions. If you're interested in the parent town, that would be you know basically adding one employee to the Hyde Park roster and sending out probably monthly bills to the other towns based on the timesheets of that person. And then and they would report time like normal, uh, but break it down by town they're working in. So that that would be an administrative cost to our our system, but not not huge since we already do it for you know, 10, 10 full-time employees. Could that administrative uh, uh, bill be shared? Or is that what we're... I, I think it probably should be, uh, but I don't know if that was included in Terry's original budget. It's not, I don't think it's huge, but it might be something just to, to be, you know, fair about it, I guess. Well, what I was thinking though is not logging their hours with the parent town each town will commit to how many hours per month and that way you already know what's going to be billed uh, yeah if it and can the be only that. extra things that would be billed is if there was an IAAO class or something like that but that would that would only happen like once every two years because all the education is free yeah no i was just uh, i'm trying to think of the um our normal process is to have a have a timesheet if people are going to do mileage, you know, the benefit costs, you know, all those things worked into a really treat it as a regular employee with the reimbursement, if you will, from the other towns. Once we conclude a month, we would send out a reimbursement request. If it, if the person can actually nail 10.0 hours or 5.0 hours every 
week that gets simple. Um, I don't know if that's quite going to be possible, but um, there may be some adjustments from week to week where somebody does six and they, sh they sh should be paid for six, but I don't know how that, and that, I don't know. I was just trying to think of the variables in payroll are not always as clean as you might want them to be. So yeah, it's, there's still administrative cost to answer Brian's question that um, uh, we'd have to calculate and maybe add that to the hourly rate, which probably wouldn't change the hourly rate much to the other towns. Well, right, and Terry, if, if each town is, here's your block of hours for the week, but what happens if, and, and again, because I, I don't know enough about it so that is this a job that it's that easy to block in those hours and it's going to be close enough every week that it works out that way but what if Hyde Park's in for 15 hours and gee we only need 11 hours of work this week but some other week we need 20 hours can you is it possible to build that kind of flexibility in it, it could be but I don't see it varying that much okay okay you know, I don't, like I said, once I see, once I get the towns that are committed and I look at the 411s, I'll pretty much let you know um, how much hours and each, each municipality is going to also chip in two hours a month for education. That's all, the education is all free, but, you know, there are webinars that you take their classes and, you know, to get to my level it, in, with the courses and stuff they'll have to take those but it's only like 40 hours a year in education this is something that we're forced to have right sure. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. So, there's no choice and we're paying a contractor now so is right. this is this going to be able it's changing the, the contractor are we seeing this as an overall cost savings or just more of a well i don't know yeah, well, I, I was going to say, does this, Ron, in the, in the budget, is this going to end up, because she sent one proposal, is this going to end up being about the same amount? Because we, right. Yes, this was something we voted on, on town meeting. Yes, yeah. So. Yeah, I think they, <laughs> when Terry tells us, <clears throat> if the board's interested, I'd, I'd, I'd sort of punt it back to Terry and have her evaluate this uh, MOU with the town of Hyde Park included and what her estimated hours are. We can then look at the contracted contract with NEMRIC, which just to give you an idea where we're at, uh, hold on one second. The uh, NEMRIC bill so far in uh, this fiscal year, which has six weeks left, is twelve thousand dollars. So that's kind of that's twelve to fourteen thousand dollars is is sort of the budget, if you will, for the contractor. I don't know what Terry's number will be uh, compared to that. I think it'll be a, a about that per you know about that for a municipality your size. Because when if you looked at that chart that I said, if you figure that out per hour, um, and you figure in the benefits and stuff, it would be twelve to fourteen thousand dollars a year for someone your size, and that's saying one day a week, eight hours a week. Let's just say. Yeah, and then that that comes with the benefits of the direct control and some of the service issues that Matt talked Matt Reed talked about earlier. Yeah, because this person will do all your mapping and all that stuff you need done. All that stuff will be taken care of through that one person. So, okay. so budget-wise, um, it's close, but with more control, which is good, and and that's what you're talking about. <laughs> and it's like I think Matt um, Matt Morin just said it was sort of mandatory. You're kind of stuck making this yeah. decision. Well, it is, but if we have something and then it's really kept up to date, that helps with your grand list. Yes. Just. Well, one of the other things, uh, Sue, that becomes a real big problem is updating the mapping. And we've talked with uh, the people that that do our that created our t tax map, and dealing with options with them on 
building these parcels for subdivisions in there and other things like that, because looking at it from the outside view of a surveyor and lawyers and wastewater permit people and the frustrations of maps that are a year old, maps have outdated data. They don't have the updated parcel data to, because if you had 10 acres and I did a 10 lot subdivision, if it's not on that map and I don't have a parcel number, um, every wastewater permit for all those 10 lots goes against your parcel number until the map gets updated. And that starts to create chaos. And this is from a user point of view. Do we want lawyers to have a good use of the town? Do we want the taxpayer to, to have his match the tax map, to, to match the wastewater permit, to match the survey all at one shot? or do we want it kind of haphazard, which is what's happening right now because we're selling and doing things faster than the maps and uh, those items are getting updated. And do you guys use CAI for mapping? Yes. Cardiographics? And uh, we, they're pretty good for us and they have a lot of features. And yeah, they are. Some, they got some other features that they can turn on via contract, or maybe somebody else could do it to do this sub parcel dash line thing and uh, pre give out parcel numbers that aren't taxed. Because you you know what I'm talking about. But you know, as a taxpayer in Hyde Park, I would want that on the tax map. So if I sold my lot, then it's done correctly right from the beginning, not kind of haphazard over time and then somebody has to go back through and spend hours trying to figure out where the lot came from, what parcel number was actually the correct one and uh, uh, mountain estates is my example. Um, if you wanna see uh, issues with tax maps and PTTRs being wrong and spending hours on just correcting and, and then calling lawyers to correct PTTRs and deeds because the tax weren't updated. Yeah. Yeah, that's 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 it's a good point too because um, I just I just took over Johnson temporarily until I could get this going, but their tax map hadn't been updated in three years, so I just got all that updated um, recently with with them. But yeah, that is an important thing with the mapping. I mean, if if you go to the if you go to the Morristown mapping because I just love, they do everything perfectly. I have all the property record cards are attached to it. You can get your tax bills, everything right from the tax maps. And if you're using that cardiographics, you could do the same thing. It's a one-time charge. And that's good to, that's good to have stuff like that because you know it makes it easier for everybody that I, I see it in Johnson where people, everybody's confused there because nobody can figure anything out where you go to Morrisville and everything's like right there. How do people feel about adopting Terry's plan? 100%. What do we need to do to move forward? <laughs> yeah. I, I, I'm all in if it, as long as it's not a huge cost. Of Obviously, right. I mean, she, she was indicating it was compatible. Yeah, correct. Yeah, it sounds pretty much the same. The right. As long as right. as long as the costs are are within yeah. a, within a margin of, of reasonability, and, yeah. and, and we're going to be only on Matt. I mean, obviously, Matt Reed decides. I mean, if he's saying this is the direction he wants to go, he, I think we lean to him. Not yeah. I'm Support not the guy that I'm not the guy that deals with all this. So right. yeah. yeah, no, it sounds like a good idea. So it looks like you've got a lot of favorable people here, Terry. Um, what do we do? What do we do next? Um, I've got two more meetings as meetings this week with a few other towns, and I'm hoping that this gets ready for this July, um, because July is the best time to start this because your grand list is all done, all your grievances are done. You're starting on your new grand list, and it'll give this person, you know, almost a year to catch up and figure out what's going on and by next year at this time, you should be pretty much up to date on everything. Okay. And we do have the uh, existing contract through June and the MOU, which is, and, and the parent 
parent company issues have to be finalized. So I think when Terry finishes her other meetings, uh, she'll be able to provide us with the estimated cost and the final draft of the MOU. And we'll, we'll take some time with that, obviously, because we want to take time with anything like a legal agreement and new employees and certainly shared services. I don't, I don't, I, I know there's a few towns that hire individual contractors to do the same job, but I don't know of too many. I think Charlotte and Shelburne, I think managed one zoning administrator not too long ago, but to have multiple towns working with one person under one sort of contract is possibly a little unique for uh, Vermont. Well, thank you, Terry. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you, thank you Matt. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Okay. The next one is planning for the uh, administra town administrator's transition to retirement. Well, Ron, what's the plan? Did you actually just say that? I think that's the first time it came out loud at a meeting. <laughs> Um, as, as you know, I've been uh, past my 30 years back, um, I'll get on two years now, so I, I call it overtime, but it's really season time, <laughs> well seasoned, uh, able to jump around and do all that stuff, but one of the things I want to do is downsize my schedule a little bit, and part of that is either continuing to work for the town in some capacity, uh, the state retirement program requires a 30 day break in service before I can draw benefits. Uh, then they allow you to come back for any VMERS town up to the 23 hours. Once you get to 24 hours a week, you have to sign up again for the deductions and all that. And that's generally not gonna have any benefit for the employee except contribute to everybody else's retirement. <laughs> so um, I don't have any time frame yet, but I just wanted to get the board thinking about uh, how we can best do this for everybody. I'm nowhere near final you know, training for uh, Jennifer, and there's uh, probably at least, at least six months more, even though we only have two months left on our probation. I think getting her through the budget season is important and, and making sure that that goes smoothly for the town. It's a big budget uh, because we do have ARPA money, FEMA money, and a huge inflation and fuel cost and all that stuff you've been talking about to deal with. So it's not gonna be a fun budget season, but uh, I did wanna get her through that process uh, at least. Um, I don't have any uh, preconceived uh, you know, uh, assumptions that you'll want me back after the 30 day break. I think that's something the board needs to talk about and figure out what role that is. I've sort of got three roles right now uh, which is planning and zoning, the, the select board, um, and all the boards and committees. And, you know, a little bit of that community development stuff, whether it's the art project on the rail trail or helping the guy in Valley Hall committee get their projects done. So there's, think of it in those three broad categories. The fourth category is something that it would be good to get rid of, which is minutes and agendas and, uh, doing all that fun stuff for the boards. So I, right now I do that for all three boards. We've advertised and haven't gotten anybody to take that, but a lot of towns do find somebody that's willing to take minutes and publish them in five days and work with their chairs to get agendas done and all that business, which is, um, you know, it's time consuming when you have um, stacked up meetings. So I, I just wanted to lay that out there because I, I think it's a collective discussion about it. I, you know, I, I don't, I'm not gonna, do any snap decisions. That's why I wanted to have a full board discussion just to get everybody's thoughts and see what you all are thinking um, and just work on it. I don't, I'm not going to surprise anybody. So I'd, I'd rather just have public discussions about it because I think that's always a good thing on something like this. And maybe if somebody hears, they'll jump in on minute taking or, or want to take over community development piece or something. I don't know. But anyway, so that's what's, that's what's going on. I don't, like I said, I'm not setting a time frame. I'm just outlining what, what my current thinking is since I'm needing to downsize my time a little bit. What were the categories that you said again, Ron? Select board, community development, 
yeah so select board is is the one that you know everything on your agenda i have to know inside and out kind of thing and that yeah. takes a lot of time the, and that goes along with contracts and legal um stuff with the town attorney the boards and committees that's planning and zoning uh separate separate from planning and zoning planning and zoning is the the formal planning commission and drb staff so i'm staffed to those two boards okay. the, the community development committees is a separate thing which almost goes in with recreation and, wow. and smaller committees that need help from time to time whether it's a coding an invoice thing whether it's a planning for a grant or whether it's you know uh, helping the fifty thousand dollar broom thing get through the town attorney which has taken a lot of time we're still dealing with that kind of on a weekly basis uh, you know i was working on that last night for example because the town attorney wants to get some document to preservation trust of vermont and he's like can you look at this because i have a couple of questions so i looked at it and responded so those are all, and those are infrequent. So the planning commission and DRB happen on a regular cycle. The committee support happens as needed. And sometimes it's a lot of work. Sometimes it's a little bit of work. And, and then you have the overall, you know, community development piece, uh, community circle, uh, in coordination with other towns and, and just things that happen that make things go better. Green up day, uh, emergency management, all those things that are important to the town, but without multiple staff people that come back to me to sort of help make sure we're in compliance with state laws and checking boxes that we need to check. Uh, so those are the three main things. The, the fourth one was the minutes, minutes and agendas and that, that kind of administrative support um, that's you know mandated by the open meeting law for you know five days to post on the agenda or five days to post minutes on the website and things like that. So I don't, I think I just want to draw that big brush to let you all think about that and let you know that there's no uh, immediacy other than to start thinking about it. Okay. So it's getting late anyway, but I just want to, if anybody has questions, feel free to call me or bring it to the next meeting or whatever if it helps the board focus and you say look you know we're ready to go anytime you can you can set a date that's one answer if you want to agree to get us through the budget season and then do a, a 30 day break that's another answer what, whatever i'm pretty flexible as you probably know what's your, what's your current contract say we have a six we have a six month uh continuing agreement in the letter of hire so it's 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 a letter of hire, which is a little bit less than a contract, but it's um, you'll see a re, sort of automatic renewal type agreement. So if, if if we don't break it, it just continues. When's that up to six months? Yeah, I think that was I think that's how it was written. This go this was written back in 2016, believe it or not, because I was <laughs> oh, I can't believe it's been six years already. August 11th, 2016. Yeah, so it's every August 11th of this year, it's up, right? No, it the it was set on July 1, 2017 as the first renewal. So it's every six months on July 1st, January 1st. Okay, every six months. Yeah, just July 1st, January 1st. Okay. How's Jen doing? Oh, that's on the agenda too. <laughs> Yeah. I know, that's why I was asking. <laughs> Come on, guys. Moving right along. It's quarter of nine. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. No, I'll just, we can leave that the way it is and then we can talk about the next one. The, um, 
Jen is, of course, she started, then she took a, a week off, and then we had COVID, so she was out of the office. I've been away, and, and we've been doing all this remote uh, training. She's doing pretty much uh, 100% of the accounts payable now, which was good. Uh, she's a quick learner there. So when, she, and in a hundred percent, I mean, ent data entry into the Nemrix module, I'm still working with her to understand the coding. <laughs> coding is, is important and you'll, and not all the department heads get it right or somebody leaves something blank. So knowing which coding line to go into it take, will take some time. You know, everybody does a little cycle of their purchasing and every time there's a, a cycle, there's always something new that pops up. So even when you think you know what the department heads are intending, uh, you still have to reach out to them. So that, that is gonna take a little more time, but the mechanics of logging in, work, working remotely, entering invoices, uh, communicating with me on Teams or walking through the share screen, all that stuff is spot on, just exactly what we need to get that stuff done. Uh, the payroll system, uh, she's overseen me uh, work through that process. Uh, she actually has a next Tuesday is our next payroll, but she's going to be out of the office on that day. So the, when she gets back for the next payroll, she's going to do the whole thing and I'll just oversee her. So I and, I and she's pretty comfortable with that now. So I just want to make sure she knows mechanically how to do it by pushing the right buttons and whatnot. So that will be done. Uh, the grants management is a big project. Uh, we have, I think, 14 grants that are ongoing right now, which take a lot of time. And that is something that I probably will split the difference on that and just sort of give her one right now to sort of oversee and get used to. Uh, but I told her uh, yesterday, I said, let's let's take it in steps. We're gonna do accounts payable first, get that nailed down. So she's basically the expert on accounts payable. She's had two training sessions with Nemric. Uh, one with Cynthia, who's uh, sort of the guru of Nemric. And then one with Wendy, who's our payroll expert. And she's done, completed both of those. And Next up is just her basically jumping into it and, and getting it fresh, sort of like operating a backhoe from the seat. <laughs> you know, you have to get in there and start doing it yourself now that she's been trained. Uh, so the grants management um, is, is interesting. There's always, and, the, and the interesting part to me is that no matter which agency you're working with, they keep changing the forms. So you have to wait for them to edit it, and then they ask you to edit it. And so we've been doing that um, on FEMA over the last couple of weeks, just getting her used to the people's names and the processes. And there's no way that we can just like turn over grants management to, to a new person. So that's gonna take uh, a while. There, there's just so much going on that's spread out, you know, every couple of weeks or every month or something like that. And it gets, uh, um, uh, not complicated, but it takes a little bit of organization so you meet your deadlines. So that's the plan anyway. Like I said, we've had limited time. It's been one month out of three um, and we've gotten through accounts payable. We're gonna knock off payroll next and then we'll start getting, and she started some HR already. I had a lot of, I had her do a lot of her own onboarding things. So she's familiar with sort of some of our people. It took a little bit longer than I expected with all this, um, all the companies that we work with, whether they're vendors or benefit providers, there's just a ton of passwords and logins and security measures that all are different for everybody. And that gets really complicated. So, and I think I've told her to take her time on that so that when she gets it all set up, she has a very easy reference to uh, be able to you know, repeat the process. A lot of these things repeat um, every two weeks or every week or every month. And once she gets involved with AFLAC, for example, she can go online and, and check out the AFLAC payments and deductions and make sure that those are accurate in our invoice. And all of that is step by step. And it takes a while. Once you get used to it and once you know where your passwords are, because I always forget mine, uh, you can usually jump into it and get it done pretty quickly. But the upload is is a lot. And so that's where the, the slow approach is what we're taking now. And I'll continue to do basically that all those job duties, either directly or gradually overseeing her uh, as she makes progress. 
uh, she's talking to Kim as well on something. So those are um, another resource for her on things like payroll and banking and accounts uh, that, that Kim all manages on her side of things as treasurer. Great. So it's not, a, it definitely is not an easy position. If, if you don't like numbers and if you don't like accounts payable and wondering about dollars and interest payments and fees and timelines, there, and she loves all that stuff. <laughs> it, it's, it, you really have to have the right brain. And I think she has that for, for what we really want her to do is keep the vendors happy, keep money flowing. And eventually we'll get to report writing and get things that you need. Um, and that's, you know, uh, one of the key things I want to get her to, which is reporting out to recreation and Guy and Valley Hall committee and select board on capital budgeting and all that fun stuff. But I think that's going to wait for um, fall when we actually get into the budget season. Yeah. Great. Speaking of budget season, Ron, is, what time of year do we have to, uh, amongst committees, request for money to carry over? Is that coming up? Yeah, so in June, if you have unspent funds, you want to get a memo to the, one of those two select board meetings. In the month of June, it has to happen. Yeah, yeah. When you, again, in June, we tend, we tend to have a really good estimate about what you're not going to be able to spend you know, by June 30. So either one of if you know you're definitely not going to spend it, you can come to the first meeting in June. I'll be here. <laughs> yeah, you will. <laughs> OK, any other things on uh, uh, Jennifer? I've been in, met with her several times, and um, she was a little stressed at, uh, a couple of times, but uh, she seems to be managing it. She was a little unsure about herself, and and her uh, and and I reassured her, and I even asked her for a sticky pad, and I said, uh, I wrote right on it, "You're doing fine." I put my name on it. You have any questions? You come to me. Okay, if you're uh, unsure about how you're doing, yeah. and I posted it on her wall, and so anyways, <laughs> yeah. uh, that helped her, I believe, to uh, have a, a visual reference to make sure she knows she's doing okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I hadn't heard any complaints at all. So, Good. anyways, I believe that helped her out quite a bit, and I'll try to keep stopping in and visiting with her and everybody else, you know, and try to stay on top of things and. Hopefully everything keeps working. Um, warrants is the next thing we've already signed. No, the one I didn't yeah, sign. It passed, it was down. I think it was that one. It was the big one. The big one? This No, this one. Oh, I think there's two spots to sign on that one, and I think yeah, you only signed. And I'm signed here. Oh, and maybe you did that. Yeah. That one only had one, one, right? Yeah. yeah. And then, but there was one I thought got missed. Oh, this one right here. This one right here. Okay. I knew it was a big one. Well, I don't know if Roland signed that one on top of the actual. I don't know. I really didn't. We shuffle them around just to make sure that you can keep them confused. And there we go. So keep all this stuff. He handed it to me, but he didn't sign it. <laughs> Which made me feel like I, I was doing something wrong. He's sleeping. Thanks. Yeah. So the warrant part is done. Um, we talked briefly, Ron, about um, just being able to access uh, everyone's ETO time. And you had made a suggestion or something. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, yes. Um, when you um, have questions, and I think that this is more of a, of a list, I think, of what I wanted what I just mentioned about the reports going to the select board, what reports are important and when do you want them and all that stuff. And I think those are the reports that Jen will eventually produce for you. I'm trying to schedule um, uh, Cynthia from NEMREC to meet with you on the 24th to go over the NEMREC report capacity. So if you say, can you provide an ETO report on how people are doing on their 300 max? 
uh, can we see that as part of our monthly reports, along with budget to actual balance sheet, cash flow, you know, whatever those kind of reports are. As long as I have a list and what the time frame is, you know, every first meeting, every second meeting of the month, whatever, then we can produce those. Um, and I think that is was my response to your ETO. The ETO is one example of a report, but uh, there's probably other reports that Cynthia can help us identify and on, on what schedule so that you know what you're looking at, first of all. Yeah. And secondly, what the questions are that the report's trying to answer, like how much cash do we have? You know, that kind of question. Yeah, money's good. Yeah. yeah, so I think that in your in the back of each one of your heads, when we do meet with Cynthia, be prepared to think about that. What would help you do your job better kind of thing when you're talking about money and, and town reports? Because I we could probably generate it, but Cynthia will give you some, you know, some suggestions when she meets with you. Good. Good. Yeah, I think that'll be very helpful. Anybody else have anything else? I do. Ron, uh, Roland does. Um, Ron, this Robert Ladd, Laird, that's mowing yeah. the lawn out here and stuff. Yes. He come to me and asked me that he wanted the money after taxes. Right. Can you, can you, he talked to you about it or whatever. Yeah, he, yeah, he texted me and I told him that uh, the request that he had was increased by $100 to cover some of the uh, tax that he had an issue with. And that his last payment of the year, we do a true up and make him whole. So you're saying, like he said, it was coming out to with the gas, the extra gas and the, the taxes and stuff was coming out to about $20 more mowing oh right? i don't know we didn't do that what, what he proposed was a schedule for the season so much a month and the only thing he asked was that his net amount equals a certain come dollar amount come out after taxes yes right and i said the, the best way to do that is we can inflate your contract a little bit so the the contract that he had or agreement was inflated by a hundred dollars and his last payment, which is fall cleanup, will ass will assess what the taxes are that was paid and make them whole in the last payment. Okay. And he didn't he didn't have any follow up text message to me well, after I told. I know I told that long a couple yeah. of years ago. Brian helped me. Yeah. And what I was you know, thinking this is why I wanted to throw it out to you and the rest of the board members. And about July out here, it's so much sand. This lawn's beginning to burn. <laughs> you know that yeah you can select where to cut and he's you. supposed to be mowing it twice one month now one of them months if we could just break even within one of them them weeks just skip a week of mowing that would take care of the extra gas and the extra taxes and everything and he would still get his money for you know like he did it yeah he, he didn't he didn't the agreement doesn't say that it says two hundred dollars a month for six months so I, I told him that his frequency is determined by his schedule because sometimes you need to mow, sometimes you don't, but he and needs to. The, it's, a, it's a contract. And the price of gas is not our fault. That Sorry, that's his fault. Well, I, I He's a contractor. Sorry. I'm not on board with it. I'm not on board with it either. And I, mean, I told that's him. That's why I'm bringing it up. No, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a right. sorry. No, he, he's a town employee that, is being paid a stipend of 200 a month to take care of the town office lawn and the rail trail lawn and the welcome sign on route 15. That's what he does for that oh. stipend every month. But you answered my question. You said at the end of the year, then you, we would look at it, right? Yeah. For the taxes, for the, the taxes tax. that, you know, we'd gross, gross up the last one to take care of taxes, which won't be that much because the contract already includes a hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. But nothing about fuel surcharge increase. We didn't. We never talked yeah, about. That. There shouldn't be. You were very generous to him, Ron. <laughs> <laughs> we're 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 okay. We'll we'll have a final settlement, and you can all see it before you pay him. Oh, he texted me again. And, and you know what? Uh, I can see it. He would oh, get right there. My job's wrong. He was wearing it right now. All right. I just have a couple little things. If you guys are 
still mm -hmm. awake. Okay, that's how I'm going. Okay. So it just wants to be it's going to be taken care of. I'm going to get that amount. It's part of being a contractor that you take the risk. Yes. Ron's got what else? What else, Ron? Um, I, did, I didn't hear a motion on the town orders. Can I have that? I move we accept the town orders. I second. All in favor signify by saying aye. I didn't know. Aye. 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 Anybody aye. opposed? Abstaining? Roland, did you abstain? He said aye. Aye, he did? Yeah. Okay. He said he was, he was moaning. He was moaning. <laughs> moaning. <laughs> Not again. Uh, uh, Kim Moulton texted tonight. And she said that due to Lamoille County being in high transmission, she's instituting the mandatory masks at work at the office tomorrow. And I didn't know if you all wanted to mention anything about public meetings or leave it optional the way it is now. Oh, I didn't know she released it. I thought it was still. No, she released it when we got to low. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, that's, yeah. So that's starting tomorrow. Who, who in here has had COVID? Twice. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> She's an overachiever. I'm an overachiever. An overachiever. So, and I'm vaccinated and boosted. Oh, well, yeah, I, I just. Am I the only one? Well, no. Matt. All right. Okay. I'm an underachiever. Yeah, yeah. I've been all know. I've been in so facilities and loaded and everything else, been all around people, talked to them. And spent hours with them. Good. Never yeah, caught yeah. it. Good. I don't know. So, yeah. I, okay. I, I would just assume leave it optional. Yeah, optional. Yeah, it's fine. I mean, yeah. optional is fine, right? I just want to. I just want to check in in case you change your mind. So that's fine. Okay, we're Good planning question. to keep it hybrid right along, right? Yeah. Too? Yep. Yeah, that'll continue. The um, last thing is the pilot project up in North Hyde Park. The oh, yeah, last time, last time we met, we had a. A ballpark of like twelve hundred dollars if highway was able to do the work and mark is sort of encouraging the contractor or or not to do it um at three thousand one hundred the cost of that would be l and d line striping would come in and apply the temporary lines for the crosswalk and the, the side lines that's required by the state of vermont on route 100 uh, this is a long term this is a two-year project that uh the Guyon Valley Hall Committee has been working on. They would pick a weekend when they have an event at the hall and the state of Vermont and regional planning would evaluate the, the pilot and then the, everything would be put back the way it was. Uh, the total project was like $20,000 uh, from an MPG grant and the town share was zero for that because we joined with the town of Belvedere. So this request is uh, to initiate the L and D contract for their quote to make the project happen with town highway doing the flagging and regional planning assisting with the the V trans people. Um, I think it's the first one in the state that V trans has agreed to do a pilot study on a state highway. They typically would say no, but due to state policy being that the money is flowing into village centers like North Hyde Park. VTrans is having to adjust their review process to accommodate um, the potential for more development in village centers, including crosswalks, narrowing, you know, Route 100 lanes and all that stuff that historically they would just say no, 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 but they're getting a lot of pressure from the administration to say, at least consider some projects. So um, North Hyde Park has the first approved project, uh, except for that $3,100 that uh, would need to happen because of the conditions to the 1111 permit from the state of Vermont. So this is costing us money. This isn't grant money anymore. Yeah. Well, if, if you look at the grant itself, it was twenty thousand dollars with no match uh, because we joined with Belvedere. Uh, this thirty one hundred dollars is the cost. If you want to call it match to the bigger project, that's what it would be. Would be. Uh, sidewalk reserve money was is set up for this already because that was intended to, to look at crosswalks and pedestrian safety over time and that's there's a quite a bit of money in that because you put 25,000 away every year and haven't been spending much of that money so we got the money yep. okay that's yes yes okay. yes okay so we need a motion 
Yeah, the motion would be to award the contract to L and D, and then the Guy and Valley Hall committee would take it from there to schedule the project. This is this is tax money that we've been that we put it that we yes that we, we put the sidewalk we allocate for a sidewalk, but it's well, this is in theory going to get us to sidewalks up there. That's yes, yeah, this, this is part of the planning expenses to get there. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, we tried one sidewalk grant with them, and they basically told us we didn't have enough information. So they've backed up, and now we're doing all this, and hopefully this will pro provide the information, and they can start putting. And, and we have up we have Spotify, so thirty one hundred plus hour only. Okay. Yeah. Right, plus the cost of labor. Right. Do we have a motion? You good? More questions? Yes, thank you. Okay, I'll I'll move it. Second. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 I don't. Anybody opposed? Yeah, I'm opposing this. Did you? There's such a thing as neutral. I know. I'm educated on it. I, no, I'm educated. I just don't know if I, I agree with it. So no, I'm not going to vote. I'm going to say no. That's okay. And you yeah. can, if you don't feel you have enough information, you can abstain. I oh can right. Say no. I can say no. You guys win anyways. No. <laughs> there, I, I I argued with you guys for the first time this year. Proud of you. We're not arguing. Oh, yeah. We're just saying we're not. You just you don't have to say that. Pat him on the back. I disputed. Yeah. yeah. We can. We have an opinion. It's okay. So chastity, chastity is it? <laughs> I'm sorry. But you want chastity is it? Uh, usually, if there's a, a vote against, I just put like chastity due to cost. Is that basic good summary? That would be yeah. my. That would, yeah. Cost and, and town resources on yeah. my end. I mean. Yeah. So what was the final vote then? What what's what's the chances Three that we two. what's the chances that we actually get anything out of VTrans? So VTrans has to do the study, and then VTrans has to approve the study to in order for us to allow the sidewalks. Yeah. So the the way that the process works is that the agency just like they just like we do for town highway they need they need to grant permission to do anything in the state highway which is what we got last week which was the 1111 permit from the state of vermont now the, this pilot project has been taking a lot of state and town and regional resources for the last two years to figure out a new process for village centers in vermont to work with vtrans there's a whole new protocol set up step by step based on our work up there so this will be you know, benefiting the state or any other village centers that want to pursue crosswalks or pedestrian improvements in state highway corridors. So we've sort of broken the egg shell open a little bit where before it would be automatic no from VTrans. This is the first yes from VTrans that I think has ever been issued for a pilot project in a village center on a state highway. So yes, the, thir the $3,100 is available. It's it, totally local tax dollars to benefit North Hyde Park, but there's also a bigger sort of regional or statewide benefit that came out of the this project. So the $3,100 will go to the state. Maybe they can put it towards mowing the rail trail. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> Ron, was that $3,100? I'm trying to remember this now, but is that to take it down after the weekend or whatever? Was it 10 days that can be up for maximum 10 days? Yeah, there's a, yeah, it's the pilot project is uh, two weeks. And then the, um, the, the removal, I think, is just a, a pressure washer or something that's to get that stuff off and then we're, and take the signs down. So there's a little bit of town highway work to do with the signs and the removal. L and D will do all the install and make it look nice. Yeah, and they hold that event, they can yeah. monitor yeah. it. Yeah. Oh, that we're thinking. <laughs> so that's all that's the all all the business I had. Oh, are you gonna skip minutes or do you wanna do those next time? Um yeah. Next time. Next time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wait, okay. Rolly fell asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Motion to adjourn. So Sorry. move. <laughs> All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Good job. Oh, goodness. We're only six after. Oh, Night, Ron. No. Yeah, good night, everybody.